Welcome and good evening. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Freeport, I welcome you to yet another Candidates Forum. It seems as though we were just here and it was just last September that we were here. Um, the League is a 103 year old nonpartisan issue oriented uh, organization dedicated to encouraging and enabling active participation in government. We do this through informing the public about their rights and responsibilities and by working to increase understanding of major policy issues. And then we urge people to get involved, to uh, become part of advocacy and work for justice for all. In the back of the room, um, over to, well, the main entrance there, I've laid on the table a num some brochures and informational uh, sheets about the League of Women Voters and even a membership form. So, you know, selling, uh, selling it a little bit here tonight. And just, I wanna to mention too, that uh, on, uh, March 28th, we meet the fourth Tuesday of the month. Um, there, we are going to have a, a wonderful program on Freeport and the current uh, health assessments data that has been just recently finished. And we're gonna have that at Burchard Hills instead of at the library where we normally meet. Health needs assessment. So that'll be interesting to hear about. Tonight's forum is being co-sponsored by the following groups. The NAACP Freeport Branch 3039B, the Highland Leadership Institute, and the Highland Student Senate. Candidates were invited, who are invited to participate tonight, will appear on the ballot on the April 4th consolidated um, municipal election. Office for, offices for which these brave citizens have decided to run are the following. Freeport City Council Alderpersons in Wards 1, 3, 5, and 7, as well as Aldermen at Large, Park Board Commissioners, Highland, Board of, uh, Highland Community College Board of Trustees, and Freeport Board, uh, School Board District 145. Questions for tonight's forum were developed by a team from the League of Women Voters, the NAACP, Highland Leadership Institute, the Highland uh, Student Senate, and we have a few of them, the gals here tonight from that organization, and also from the Freeport Education Association. I wanna especially acknowledge and thank the following who did a wonderful job on helping to organize this. Uh, Jennifer Konoski, Pat Norman, and Andy Dvorak. The timers tonight are uh, Marilyn Miners and Judy Shim from the League of Women Voters, and they're assisted by two gals from Three, okay. You want to just quickly say your first names? Yeah. Addison, Chloe, Chloe and, Zara. and Zara. So thank you very much for participating and getting involved in uh, uh, elections and education and uh, along with your uh, interest in politics and what happens in government. Um, the moderator for this evening is, for the second time, uh, James Winker, social studies teacher at Freeport High School for well over 30 years. Jim is an educator who keeps himself well informed on current issues, as well as serves as the coordinator for the history series at the public library. And probably many of you have uh, taken advantage of those wonderful lectures. All candidates, candidates running opposed will be invited to the stage where they will give a one minute opening statement, a one minute closing statement, and their answers will be limited, uh, the answers to the questions we'll give them will be limited to one and a half minute. Each question will be answered by each candidate, and then there will be a rotating order in which they will answer the first question. Those who are running unopposed will be given an opportunity to stand and make a three minute statement about themselves and why they are running for the office. And then we added one other thing this year, those who are unable to attend tonight were given the option to write a two minute statement and assign someone to come and read it for them. And we're not sure whether uh, anyone has taken advantage of that, but we'll find out. Um, and now, without further ado, here is our moderator for the evening, James Winker. All right, good evening. 
It's always good to be at a forum where democracy can play itself out. I always tell my students, it's one thing to run for president where you're on the national stage or a state office where you're on the you know, statewide state, but when you're running locally, that takes some courage because everybody knows where you live. <laughs> and so thank you to all the candidates who are willing to, to participate. Uh, whether they're here or whether or not. So we're gonna begin with the city council alderman candidates. Um, they can come to the stage if you're here. Uh, Joy Sellers may have sent somebody to give a statement on her behalf, we're not sure. Anybody come to speak on behalf of Joy? Okay, well, we have three, oh, you, you oh, no. <laughs> um, we have three minute statements from candidates who are running on unopposed. So I'd ask Tom Clem and Rachel Simmons and Cecilia Stacy to come on up and you can give a three minute uh, statement. Tom, you're running for Ward One. For Ward One, yes. yes. Again. <laughs> So hold your applause, please, so everybody's done. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Clem. It's nice to be here tonight. Uh, and I'm excited to be running for First Ward Alderman again. I ran for First Ward, I was First Ward Alderman from 2003 to 2019, serving under Mayors Gallrap, Getz, and Miller, and look forward to the opportunity to serve the, co the community again. Here's a little bit of information about me and why I'm choosing to run for First Ward Alderman. I was born and raised in Freeport, a community of which I'm proud of and to be part of and have called home for the vast majority of my life. My mother made history here in Freeport by being the first woman tavern owner in the city of Freeport. Now, if you can think about that, that's 1947. So, you know, uh, ladies have been held back for a long time. Uh, I'm a 62 graduate of Freeport High School. Following high school graduation, I worked at Microswitch for a short period of time and voluntarily joined the Marine Corps and served in Vietnam. After returning from Vietnam, I worked in the construction industry and my wife and I purchased uh, my mother's tavern for a period of time and we owned it until 1972 until our son was born, Andrew. I then after uh, that, we sold it and I started a flooring business, which I was in for 25 years here in Freeport. In the years following that, I worked in business and in sales, estimating and management segments of the construction industry, including plumbing supplies, HVAC and other areas. During my career, I was fortunate enough not only to attend, but be an inaugural member of the Highland Leadership Institute, which I found to be incredible, incredibly valuable and rewarding for educational experience right here in our hometown. I'm so proud to have met my wife, Jane, of 53 years here in Freeport. She's also a graduate of Freeport High School. We have two children, Andrew and Anna Marie, both of whom are graduates from, graduates from Freeport High School and both work in the finance industry in Chicago. Andrew is in private equity in an HVAC firm, the CFO, and Annie is working for a telecommunications firm, uh, both doing great. We have two wonderful grandchildren, like everybody has wonderful grandchildren, Harrison and, and uh, Andrew, and both of them love to visit the Pretzel City and eat Mrs. Mike's because we either have them out here or take them in all the time. <clears throat> I enjoy, being, I enjoy being of service to our community and all its members. I volunteered my time to serve on many boards and organizations in various capacities throughout my lifetime in the city of Freeport. Some of the highlights in serving as president of the school board for two years during my eight year tenure. Yes. Stop, we're done? Okay, thank you. <laughs> but I really look forward to uh, serving the uh, citizens of Freeport in the first ward again. Thank you. So wave those signs. How are you doing, Miss Stacy? Doing good, thank you. <clears throat> Good 
My name is Cecilia Stacy, and I am running for Fifth Ward Alderman. I was born and raised in Freeport, and I've lived here my entire life. 30 years ago, I married the love of my life. Together, we have two adult children and one grandson. In 1999, we moved from Third Ward to Fifth Ward and purchased our current home. I have dedicated much of my life and career to helping people in our community. I have worked for the Freeport School District for 19 years. I am a faithful member of Faith Center Freeport. It is my place of worship for the last 12 years. I'm also a proud member of the United Steel Workers Local 745 for 19 years. I've held many positions, a steward all the way to unit chair president for eight years. To the people of the doors I've knocked on, I hear you loud and clear. Allow me to expand on your top three concerns. Our streets, potholes are everywhere. Like you, I've asked myself, can they get any worse? Why do they remain in this shape? I don't have the answer, but it's time we find out. Crime, we need people to feel safe. Something as simple as better lighting would be a start. We need a crime prevention plan and the time is now. An assessment with no plan is simply not enough. Landlords, it's time to hold them responsible for their properties. Some must come down, others need repairs and upkeep. No more destroying our neighborhoods with your mess while you're living across town or in another city. All these issues require communication in order to be resolved. Not one entity of the city have the power to do it alone. I'm asking you to help me help us. I'm not afraid to have the hard conversations for a closed mouth will not be fed. Help me help us address issues from your perspective that I may be fully equipped when delivering our concerns to the table at City Hall. I have and will continue going door to door campaigning, even though I'm unopposed. I want to meet you, the people of Fifth Ward. I want to know your thoughts and hear your concerns. Last but not least, I want you to know this face, for it is my desire to get your respect and your vote April 4th. All right, thank you. We're gonna have uh, Troy Barr and Andrew Misek and Larry Sanders come up, please. Troy Barr is running for Alderman at large and Andrew Misek and Larry Sanders are running for the Ward 7 Alderman position. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll start with a, a one minute opening uh, statement uh, from each of you, and we'll start with Mr. Barr and then go to Mr. Misek and then Mr. Sanders. So thank you, Mr. Barr, go ahead. Thank you very much and, and welcome everybody. And thank you for coming out, I appreciate it. My name is Troy Barr and I am running for Alderman at large, which I currently hold the seat as Alderman at large for the city of Freeport. Why am I running? Because Freeport's my home. I've lived here my entire life. I've, I've served in, in, in this community in various capacities and, and this is home. I love Freeport. I love everything about Freeport. I would have left had I had, you know, had I, I not enjoyed being here. 
I'm a graduate of, High, of Aquin High School, Highland Community College, and the first graduating class of Columbia College at Highland Community College. I also have a master's degree at, from Cardinal Stritch University, all of which I obtained while living, working, and raising a family here with my wife, Renee, our two boys, Caleb and Joseph, and my granddaughter, who now lives in Broadhead, Wisconsin, Carmen. I want to thank each and every one of you. I'm proud to be here and serve this community, and I hope to continue to serve the community and earn your vote. Thank you. Go ahead, Andrew. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you guys for inviting me to your guys' forum tonight. Uh, my name is Andrew Meisick, and I am running for the seventh ward alderman. I have lived in Freeport my entire life and graduated from Freeport High School in 2019. I own and operate Andrew's Lawn Care and Landscaping here in Freeport. I started the company when I was a freshman in high school. I started the company to serve the community. I have never, I never would have known where it would take me today. As an alderman, I am here for all of the seventh ward. I wanna be an ear for the citizens of Freeport to be listened to. For many years, people were not heard and I wanna be that change. Feel free to call me with any questions. I will continue to ensure that Freeport is a safe place to live and work. Safety is an utmost priority of mine. Another huge priority of mine is to make sure that we have great infrastructure and roads that will be maintained to the best of our capabilities. In my experience of running Andrews Lawn Care, I learned how to effectively communicate and ensure that each customer is taken care of with the utmost respect and dignity. Um, thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to your guys' vote. Uh, Mr. Sanders? Hi, everybody. My name is Larry Sanders, and I am running for the Alderman of the Seventh Ward. I have lived in Freeport for 40 years. I graduated from, high from Freeport High School, where I participated in many sports, football, basketball, and baseball. After high school, I continued my education in computer science and music at Highland, Russ College, and Northern Iowa. When I came back to Freeport, I worked at Kelly's, Michael Switch, and, Park, and the Park District, Structo, and then worked 28 years at the Freeport Water and Sewer Department. I returned to Highland for more computer certification and began my business building a radio station, Flight Radio Studio. I am running for aldermen to change politics in our city. I want. All right. Well, now we're going to start. Uh, we got four questions. We'll uh, start with uh, Mr. Mysick first, and we'll kind of alternate with who starts. You're going to have 90. So you, you are going to have a minute and a half. So uh, you'll have a little bit longer to answer these questions. And so if you need me to re restate them, I will. But uh, so the first question to Mr. Mysick is this, uh, community safety is a concern in Freeport. And the question is specifically, do you have any thoughts on how to address these issues? And do you have any particular opinion on the community safety plan that was written by Patrick Sellers and presented to the city council? And why or why not? And, Got it. Your okay. thoughts on that? 90 seconds. That's a great question. Um, I think first thing first is um, kind of seeing, I know the police department's having a hard time keeping staff. And I feel I'm as a business owner, I take care of my core. And I want to make sure that my core is paid at a standard that, okay, they might look over here that's offering a higher pay. And they might say like, well, I could go over here and over there. Well, I want to set the standard high that if we're going to hire new officers, we want to make sure that their pay grade is going to be good enough to sufficient them for one. For two, I think the crime rate um, is definitely going to need some assistance. I think that the area of Freeport definitely has crime, and I think there's ways that we can do to improve it. Now, I'm not an expertise on crime, but I know that there's definitely areas that we need to improve. Um, now, back to Patrick Seller's plan, I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. There's a lot of good things that Freeport can take from there, but also there, there's things that we have to be able to see, like, can we make, accomplish this? Is this something that we can do? And that takes a lot of time and that takes a lot of facts to be able to figure out, okay, what is a city capable of doing and what are we currently doing? And I feel like there's, there's kind of has to be a mixture in the middle of that. So that's kind of answering my question. All right, thank you. Mr. Sanders, same question. Crime is public safety is the ultimate 
plan and evaluation and studies that should happen within our city limits. And I feel that um, with this thing that's going on with Patrick Sello's plan and everything behind the scenes of his plans, we need to develop a new plan each and every year, evaluate it, bring it up to date. I think that's the kind of plan that we're looking for, how are we gonna be stronger in our own studies of how crime can be prevented. prevented. So if we do a, a, a study more so than what we're doing today in the crimes that are coming in and how do we prevent them and how do we know who the criminals are, we have to be able to uh, find another solution, evaluation, and study that might come under the under a committee uh, that is doing oversights for any organizations that is dealing with uh, crime prevention. We need to be able to have those kinds of studies on a regular basis because people are getting hurt, killed, and, and everything else that you can imagine. And so my whole thing is, and after I say this, is that uh, we need to get another time clock. That's what we need to do. All right. Mr. Barr. Sure. Would you mind repeating the question? I just will. To be community Thank safety you. is a concern. Do you have any thoughts on how to address the issue? And do you have an opinion on the community safety plan written by Patrick Sellers and presented to the city council? Why or why not? Thank you for repeating that. No problem. So, so safety, obviously it's a concern for everyone. It's a concern for me. I live here. We all live here. Hard conversations have to happen. And one of the things I think we need to do is realize as a community, we have to look at ourselves. We're all responsible for safety in this community. We can't pretend that it's the police department's responsibility alone, or that it's the, the teacher's responsibility alone to discipline kids or whatever the situation is. We all have a responsibility to create a safe environment in this community. And that means encouraging people to come forward when they see a crime or um, you know, maybe coming forth themselves, getting cameras on their doors and so forth, which I know there's programs going on where that's happening right now. So it's just a continued conversation that has to happen amongst all of us as a community to, to encourage safety. With regards to the plan, I am familiar with the plan. Mr. Sellers, he, he reported out to the city council. I've read the plan and I've heard a lot of conversation about the plan. And I think there are phenomenal parts of the plan. Actually, the whole plan is very good. What I personally would like to see is a robust and engaging conversation between Mr. Sellers, the community, and the police department on how that plan can be tackled. I personally have gotten an email from Mr. Sellers as an alderman. I've reached out to him and said I'm willing to discuss and talk about the plan at any time, and I am still waiting on that response. So I hope to hear from him, and I am open to anyone's conversation about safety. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. The second question, we'll start with uh, Mr. Sanders. Uh, given the fact that we have a city manager, what do you see as the appropriate role for an alderman and what skills and interests do you have that you will bring to the city council if elected? Okay, uh, with the new city manager or one going in, coming in and one going out, the first thing is first, uh, talk with the city manager about past historical things that he has discovered so he can share with the general public. Uh, with the new uh, city manager that might be coming in, we also should co consult with her about her ideology of what Freeport is about, what Freeport stands for, how do we change the, uh, the major problems that is uh, becoming a pandemic to me. We may not associate those two words together, but the idea is how do we make connection with the city manager to make sure that people are engaged to understand what is really taking place within our city programs and things of that nature? Why is it that some side, some parts of the city is getting more uh, jobs or more infrastructure work, potholes and things like that than others? I see you, sister. And, uh, <laughs> And how do, we, how do we make this a fair play all across the board or all across the city? And how come we, don't, we should have a, a forum or oversight and a uh, committee? We should have more committees on the board and throughout the councils of the city. And then we, <laughs> she tried to catch me that time, but then making sure 
that we acknowledge all problems within the city. All right, Mr. Barr. Thank you. So when I think about the role of the, of the city council member, I think really two words come to mind and that is stewardship and accountability. So, and they both, they kind of go together. So I, I think as a city council member, it's, it's my responsibility to be a steward for the citizens and as alderman at large, it's the entire city. So it's not a particular ward. So it's not a more important role by any stretch. It's just a, a larger demographic, a larger group of people that I have to support. And I am committed to doing that. It's also stewardship to the, the, city, the city leaders, the directors and the city manager and the mayor and, and letting them hear what the voices are, are saying out on the streets so that we can make sure that we're doing all the right things or the very best we can do as a city. With regards to um, the accountability, I, do, I, I, I don't know how else to say it, but it is the city council members to hold the leaders accountable in our city. That comes from your voice as a community, and it comes from my voice as a, as a city council member, but are we spending the money correctly? Are we going along the right path with respect to um, economics and so forth? So it is absolutely the, the obligation to hold the city leaders accountable. With regards to my skills, um, I, I wear my heart on a sleeve and I'm passionate about Freeport. I love this community and, and I, I hope that you feel that. So thank you. All right, Mr. Mysek, could you possibly repeat the question? Sure, please? no problem. Given the fact that we have a city manager, what do you see as the appropriate role for an alderman and what skills and interests do you have that you will bring to the city council? So I see an alderman as a messenger, as the people call me and say, hey, this is an issue that's going on. For an example, I had somebody call me the other day and they said that they're having a sewer problem and it's backing up and they're having issues. I called, I called Public Works immediately and I said, hey, what, what's going on with this? What can be done about this? And, you know, I guess there's some tree roots in the line, so they got them out and it's had no issues. So number one is I'm the messenger. People call me and say, hey, I got an issue or this is what I feel is the issue. And I go and I'm able to address that and say, hey, this is what this is a possible solution. Here's what can be done. Um, I feel like I'm not here. I'm here to serve the people. I'm not here to serve myself. And I really feel that we're here for the people and I'm here for the, what their what their best interest is. I absolutely love the city of Freeport. I've been raised and born here my entire life. And I just want the best for the citizens. I want what's best for Freeport and I wanna move this community forward. All right, thank you. Well, Mr. Barr, you'll get this question first. Uh, what do you think the role of the city should be in regulating landlords and their responsibility in maintaining their properties and their obligations to their tenants? Okay, thank you. Hot topic, I'm sure, right? Yeah, <laughs> I heard it, it is a very hot topic. Freeport has changed drastically in, in my life um, with respect to ownership of properties. I mean, we all know it. it. That's why we're here. That's why we're listening to us, the candidates. We, we feel it every day. Um, as far as the city's responsibility, I think it is an absolute responsibility to enforce the codes that are there. I think, you know, there, there's, there's ordinances and codes that we have on the books. We have to enforce them, okay? But also we have to continually look at them and make sure that the right ordinances and the right right approach to dealing with these landlords. Quite honestly, some of the landlords are, are ghosts. They, they're hard to find. So we have to find a way to locate them and enforce the bylaws that are out there on the books. I also believe in the good neighbor policy. And actually I'm stealing that from manager Randy Bucus. I believe it, he mentioned it to me. And I, I said, you know what? I absolutely agree with you. And that is, if you put a flower in your front yard, it's likely your neighbor will put a flower in their front yard. It doesn't always happen that way, but I believe if you maintain your property, your neighbor's going to maintain their property. It just, I mow my lawn. I've got retired neighbors around me and I get guilty, feel guilty when they're mowing their lawn because I'm like, I got to get to it. You know, it looks terrible, but it absolutely works. So taking care of your own property, taking responsibility for our own properties, I think will help the cause. So thank you. All right, Mr. Meissner. So I, obviously with rental properties, I, I can't remember the number, but I believe there's like 4,600 rental units in Freeport, which makes up majority of the housing that we have. It really comes down to ownership of the landlord. Um, there's a lot of good rental properties in this town, and I really feel like they have a lot of potential. But also there's a lot of hiccups that landlords have to go through in order to renovate their properties. You know, you can't just throw a million dollars at it and just say it's done and over with. It takes time. And I really feel like I think there should be some grace to those landlords that are trying to fix up their place, but also we should hold those people accountable that just don't care. 
And I really feel like that that's just, there's an, there's no medium ground. I really feel like we should give some grace to those that are actually trying, but also the ones that are not, we should just say, you know what, we gotta, we gotta get something about this because it can't look like this. It can't stay like this. And Mr. Sanders, same question about city landlords. Well, uh, city landlords recognize the fact of the migrations from various parts of the, of the country. And uh, everybody is not equal to everybody in combination in the economy of their own uh, value here in this city. So they migrate to small towns in order to find better ways to live their lives and things of that nature. But we don't have what we call a committee to determine what type of uh, tenants that we're having, what kind of landlords that, we're have, that we have. I don't know the ordinances I don't know the uh, the status of what landlords go through and what their economic status is and keeping property up and down and whatever the case is, but the landlords also have to be aware of their tenants that are bringing in destruction to the to their property, no upkeep, no understanding what it is that Freeport is operating under. So they have no clue about how Freeport actually is organized and what is, uh, keeping them from being able to move ahead or finding the resources that they would need in order to help landlords or any citizen in the city of Freeport. So I'd like to uh, address the things that the plans that uh, uh, Patrick Seller had put in place. It also talks about those types of things, a migration of new tenants, new people that are coming in with no... no uh, All right. Fastest 90 seconds, right? Yes, sir. All right, last question for, for this round. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Mysek first. What do you see as some of our community assets and strengths, and how can these be used to attract more businesses and industry to Freeport? Could you repeat that once more? I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll speak more clearly. <laughs> what do you see as some of our community assets and strengths, and how can these be used to attract more businesses and industry to Freeport? Well, there's a lot of assets in Freeport. Um, for me, I personally love the downtown. And once you get up in the Stewart Center and you just look over downtown, you just see how beautiful it is. And there's so many historic buildings there that, for example, Wagner House has put tons of money and just go into the building and look at how that looks. Just looks absolutely fantastic. Instead of letting the building deteriorate, they put money in it. They're like, well, let me see what I can do with the community. Now that's a community hotspot there. That place is hopping. There's people coming in and out of there. There's people that are spending money there, which also helps the tax base, which also helps the city. And I really feel like we could we could invest some money there into downtown. I know some people might not agree, but I absolutely love the way that the downtown looks and I like the, the way that we're going. Okay, Mr. Sanders. The tax dollars are flowing, uh, not equal across the board. So we can't treat everything equal as if everybody has the same assets or the finances to keep up with the beautification of the city of Freeport. We just don't have it like that. We have to acknowledge the fact that where we at with all citizens here in the city of Freeport, uh, what their economic status is, uh, how are they approaching uh, the re rehabilitation of their homes and things like that. Everybody just don't have the finances to do so. And so we have to find plans and, and opportunities to make resources available for those who are trying to upgrade their home, their status, upgrade the uh, property, their, their uh, neighborhoods, to attract new businesses to come into their local area. But we have to remember, it's all about the zoning. If we uh, can uh, minimize some zoning so people can start up business as opposed to fighting people with the opportunities of uh, taking on the, the business aspect of everything, I can uh, assure you a, a lot of major changes can help a lot of people if they had the, the very resources that would help them uh, navigate their way through these types of uh, resources. And uh, I think I was ahead, so. So I'm gonna try, try this here, but I think I think in order for when when businesses, new businesses, want to come into Freeport and they neglect certain areas of Freeport to put their business in place. Thank you. All right, Mr. Barr. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
assets. I think assets are, are kind of hard to define because I think it depends on where you're at in your life. Everybody out here probably has a different opinion of what the greatest assets are of Freeport. It could be our parks. We're about to hear from the park board candidates. It could be our schools. We're going to hear from school board candidates. We're sitting in a great asset right now, Highland Community College. There's many, many things about this community that are fantastic. But I think the greatest asset is, is right here, the people in this room. And I'm not a politician, so it's, I'm not, ask my wife. It, so it's not a corny politician statement. The reality is, is all of you showed up because you have a passion about what Freeport has to offer the great assets that are in Freeport. So I think the greatest asset being the people is the involvement. There needs to be this much involvement all the time. And I think if we can continue to get that, people showing up for meetings like this, city council meetings. I had a meeting last night for downtown business owners, showing up for those types of meetings and only improving everything around us, I think the assets will continue to grow. The last thing that I'd say on that is our young people. They are a great asset as well. And we need to find a way not only to encourage them to get involved, but to come back to Freeport after they go off to college or trade school or whatever it is. They're leaving in droves and they're not coming back. It's not because it's a great, not a great community. It's because they think it's better somewhere else. We have to convince one of our greatest assets that this is a great place to live and come back. All right, thank you. Well, now we're gonna have a one minute closing statement from each of the candidates. We'll start with Mr. Sanders this time. In, clo in closing, I'd like to say thank you to the league for putting on this event in, to uh, inform voters. We need these types of communications to hear the voices of our citizens. The issue we talk about tonight just touched the surface. This needs to be an ongoing discussion. The people of the seventh ward should not be overlooked or left out of the discussion. I hope I've learned, I hope I learn your votes, I earn your votes, I'm sorry, to make that communication happen on a regular basis. It's not happening now with the current administration. We need to change, make our voices heard at the city council table. We need change to address crime and public safety. We need change to address improving our streets and lighting. We need change to make Freeport more affordable for all. On behalf of myself, my lovely wife and family, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Naughty. Barr. That was naughty. Thank you, this poor young lady has the worst job in the room right here. So, so in closing, I'd just like to say that during my short time already as alderman at large, I've been very proud to serve. And you know, I recognize that alderman at large is the entire city. And so I am open to hearing from anyone across the entire city at any time. I'm very proud that any call I've ever received or any email at this point, any of them, I have returned a phone call or an email. I have not disregarded any email or phone call. And I'm extremely proud of that because it's you that run the city, your voice, and you need to be heard. And it's my responsibility to take that back to the city council. I'm committed to continuing that practice and I'm committed to this city. And I hope I can earn your trust and your vote. So again, thank you for being here and thank you to the league. Mr. Mysek. Thank you guys for coming tonight. I appreciate the forum and appreciate the group that got this going. Um, you guys are obviously not, you're doing this for free. You guys are volunteering because you care about Freeport. So just know that. As I stated before, I'm here for all of the seventh ward residents and I wanna be there for them to listen and to address their concerns. I'm going to be the ear that listens. So when you call me, let me know your concerns. I'm gonna do something about it. I might not be able to promise you that this your, your roads is gonna be fixed this month and this date, but I'm at least gonna be able to get that message relayed to the people that actually are in charge of, okay, when we're we gonna to do with this road fixed. I will also continue to ensure that Freeport is a safe place to live and work. I will also ensure that our roads are safe and managed to the best of our city's capacity. With my experience in the business world, this will give me the opportunity to effectively communicate and ensure that all the community's needs are met with utmost respect and integrity. I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to serve you as a seventh ward, and I hope to earn your vote in the April 4th election. All right, well, I think we can give them all a round of applause. Thank you all very much. Visit, uh, visit with the NAPS, the event. We'll have the three Park Commissioner Board candidates now come up. Sally Peterson, Deb Schwartz, and John Watson.
There are um, three candidates running for two seats on the park board. All right. Well, we'll kind of follow the same pattern that we did with the last uh, the last group throughout the evening. So uh, we'll start with a one minute opening statement from each of you. We'll start with Miss Peterson and then go down the line, and then we'll have five questions. But you have a you have one minute for your opening statement. Good evening. I'm Sally Peterson, and I'm nervous. <laughs> I, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I'd like to thank the host. Um, I appreciate that you want to be an informed voter. I have a degree in therapeutic and outdoor recreation. I have 40 years experience working in the field of recreation and leisure, programming for a variety of population groups. I've created budgets, and I've also had to live within budgets that were presented to me. Um, part of my experience during my first half of my career was working as extended services supervisor at the Freeport Park District. Um, while I was there, um, I, I believe I became very familiar with the inner workings of the departments um, and of our facilities and our parks. I developed the Dad Daughter Candyland Ball over 25 years ago. It's still grow going strong, and I'm very proud of that. Um, that was started with an idea and a shoestring budget. So I think I'm um, frugal especially when it concerns other people's money. Um, so I feel like that I would be respecting your money also. Thank you. Hey, Ms. Schwartz. Good evening, I'm Debbie Schwartz. I'm married to David for 38 years. We have two daughters and three grandchildren. I've been a Freeport area resident most of my life having grown up in Cedarville. I'm currently on the park board serving as past president and two six year terms. We've done much to develop our already wonderful parks. We have new bathrooms and crepe, also pickleball courts that I enjoy using a lot. Major upgrades to Oakdale, our nature park, baseball complex in Reed and Taylor Park ball diamonds, walking and ADA paths in Reed and crepe, just to mention a few. I'm interested in remaining on the park board as I wanna to continue to enhance the quality of our living in our community by drawing out of town visitors to Freeport. This contributes to our restaurants and lodging and other activities and attractions. I love our parks and community. Thank you. All right, Mr. Watson. Hey. See, I pretty much posed this two days ago. And this is, <laughs> I'll try this again. Um, I'll give you my bio first. I'm, I see a lot of faces in here that I grew up with, I see teachers that uh, I see people that uh, I delivered papers to. So I was born and raised here. Then I was a Highland student for about not quite four years. Met my wife in the pit in Mano Mancha. And then she went off to Wheaton and then I went off to NIU. I was there for about three years. I studied history and philosophy. And then um, she went to grad school and I hung out in Champaign and read books and, um, Worked at a bookstore, painted houses. Oh, 15 seconds. Uh, <laughs> all right, I raised two wonderful kids here uh, with my fantastic wife, Laura, and I'll save resume for later. All right, well, Thanks. thank you very much. Our first question will go to Ms. Schwartz, and then we'll kind of work down and around just like we did last time. So, Ms. Schwartz, what's your motivation for running for this position on the park board? You have a uh, 90 seconds to answer. Well, it's a short answer. I've always been wanted to be in, oh, I'm sorry. I've always wanted to be involved in the community. And when I left micro switch after 35 years, I immediately became a master gardener and ran for the park board. I reinvented myself and I'd like to continue to do so in that capacity. Thank you. Mr. Watson. Motivation, motivation for running. Yeah, what's your motivation for running? What, what, um, I, kind of in the vein that others have talked about tonight, um, service. Um, but uh, I want to get involved in in my community. 
Um, I have a background in education, but uh, you probably see me out riding my bike with my dog in, in most of the parks. We were in Taylor Park yesterday, two days ago, where it's still a swamp. Um, yeah, I, I the, the two ladies here are, I, I, this is so weird because I don't want to run against somebody, but I want to participate in, in uh, my community and if uh, I get to talk about myself a little more, maybe uh, maybe I can convince you that I'd be a decent guy on the park board. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Peterson, same question. What's your motivation for running? I have a passion for the parks. Um, I'm in our parks almost daily um, in several capacities. If I'm not enjoying my own leisure for my own pleasure, um, I've also been involved since retirement with the pretzel pickers, picking up trash. <laughs> so I, I love our parks. Um, my background's in recreation. When I heard there was um, two openings and that only one person had turned in their um, signatures, I thought, this is a perfect fit for me. This can be my passion project. I've been looking for something to do in my retirement that was truly my passion project, and I think this is a perfect fit. All right, thank you very much. Well, Mr. Watson, you'll get the, the first uh, shot at the second question. How would you balance the expenditures of the park to keep park services and areas equally funded? Should the emphasis on Crate Park and Park Hills Golf Course be broadened to include other parks? Please stay with them. Sure. It. How would you balance the expenditures to keep park services and areas equally funded? Should the emphasis on Crate Park and Park Hills Golf Course be broadened to include other parks? So, yeah, one of my philosophies of, of participating on the board would be um, fair distribution of resources. Um, I, I'm not sure if the people on the board now look at it as um, if I spend money on Crate Park, will everybody in the community can use Crate Park. Um, I'm not a golfer, um, uh, but I don't think it's a bad thing for the town to have a public golf course. Um, I guess one thing we could use are some small, small parks. Maybe some of the landlords could take that $800 property that they bought on auction and just give it to the, the city and we can turn it into another small park for uh, say all the, the young ladies who have uh, kids running around say up and down um, uh, Galena or Adams. We don't really have anything over on that side of town. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, I have 30 seconds to talk about equal funding for the whole town. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we'd have to talk about. You'd have to talk about what we've done with Taylor Park or haven't done with it, how much control the park even has on what we can do at Taylor Park. Um, I know we have uh, a park for small small play areas for uh, most of the town, but yeah, on, on the, uh, I live in the seventh ward. We don't Time's, have anything. Time's up. <laughs> Got to keep an eye on those ladies in the front row. Miss um, Peterson. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. How would you balance the expenditures to keep park services and areas equally funded? Should the emphasis on Crate Park and Park Hills Golf Course be broadened to include other parks? With the services that are there and the facilities that are there, I don't think you could balance funding across the city because they're just, I mean, the, it costs more to run a golf course than it does a small like Knowlton Park. I mean, so you can't balance it, but it's important that we maintain everything and take a look at what's the programming that's going on around the community so that all the programming doesn't happen just in a couple of areas that we get the programming out. Um, I would certainly like to see programming is my background. And I understand as a board member, I won't be the programmer anymore, but I can certainly bring concerns and ideas back to the board um, for what could possibly be, be ideas that would certainly feel more balanced. Um, yeah, thank you. Ms. Schwartz? 
Well, actually, they are balanced. We go by needs of the particular parks. We just spent over $800,000 at Oakdale with the grants and money that we had. And we gave it a huge upgrade. And we're spending another $25,000 out there for the woods and the tree areas to clean that up and get it right. And as far as being unbalanced, the golf course is self-supporting. It's still running on dollars that it made back in its heyday. It is, it's not using taxpayers' money as we speak. So that's something that maybe you don't know, but everything is fair and balanced. Another thing that we've done, we just did Winter Park. We redid that entire thing, put in a new playground. We got a, a grant from uh, Morton Arboretum and we planted tons of trees out there and grass and wild grasses. If you tour our parks, I think you'll see it is really fairly balanced. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Our next round, our next question will go to Ms. Peterson first. Um, the park board has been in the process of buying properties on Birchard Avenue and tearing down some homes on those lots. And they also recently tore down the homes on Park Hills Golf Course and Crape Park. Uh, do you support these actions? Why or why not? What do you see as the purpose of this type of thing? Um, my understanding uh, from, you know, in listening and reading uh, was that some of those properties were torn down because the park district wanted to get out of for, away from being a landlord. Um, the house, the executive director house, uh, the executive director did not want that house anymore. A lot of upkeep needed to be done to it. Um, I'm glad I wasn't on the board at that time. I think those had to have been very hard decisions. It would have been very hard for me. Um, and had I been on, I certainly would have listened to both sides. I'm, I'm taking from what I have heard of the reasons why it happened. Um, so supporting it, it, it did happen. And I'm fortunate that I didn't have to make those hard decisions. Um, but yeah, what was the first part? Oh, um, about uh, purchasing properties on Birchard Avenue and taking down homes on those lots. Okay, and, and those are properties, okay. Well, if it's, if it's to expand um, the parks, I'm, I'm all for it. Those, I'm understanding it's the properties right across from the administration building. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know that people, generally that's happening as people move away or have passed away, um, that they are, so that there is less conflict for what's happening next to the parks. <laughs> Ms. Schwartz, same question. Um, the houses on Birchard were purchased, the owners, came to the park board, the park district, and asked us if we were interested and we never pay more than assessed value. The house that was on the corner of Birchard and Empire at 1010 next to the tennis courts was an eyesore and it wasn't taken care of. Um, the property, the trees were growing over the path and the sidewalk. And I guess there's a master plan that was put together before I got on the board to make more green space, which makes sense as opposed to dilapidated houses. Um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, uh, the tearing down of the homes of, on Park Hills Golf Course and Crate Park. Those were because we decided we did not want to be landlords anymore. And that is the way it went. They were both needed dire repair. And you know, you can't rent something that's in your favorite park to just anybody, what if we had somebody there that flew a Nazi flag and threw beer cans out on the road? So we just did not want to be landlords and have people living in our parks. All right. I guess that's my answer. Mr. Watts? Um, I guess I'll pivot back to the thing I was talking about earlier, which is uh, if you're going to buy property, you could probably get a property for $815 at the auction and uh, turn it into a, a, a small uh, play area for, for communities where the play areas aren't really around and within walking distance. For I, one, In my resume, one of, one of the things I, I did recently was I learned to drive a school bus. And uh, so I traveled on all the school buses and there are plenty of um, uh, yeah, we pick up young kids all over town, all over town 
where obviously the mother uh, is by herself, doesn't have a, um, sometimes you can tell they don't have a lot. They don't have obviously transportation and uh, uh, I have enough time to talk about uh, Jane Adams and her uh, uh, creation of, of play areas. The first play areas were uh, right across the street from um, Hall House. And that'd be a good example for us to use in our town if, if the parks would, you know, if, if we are gonna buy properties, we could buy properties in an area that uh, is really needed. Okay, I'll quit. All right. Uh, well, Ms. Schwartz, we'll start with you with this question. Uh, are there recreational features that the park doesn't currently offer that you think they should? Uh, we're, we're always changing what the parks offer, of course, as times change. Uh, pickleball is now new and that's come on in the last few years, but are there things that you think we could offer or should offer that uh, would be on your radar in the coming years? Well, I think there's always opportunity for something new for any group. Um, we don't have much for seniors. I've seen where they have like playgrounds set up with senior exercise equipment for outdoors. And we've never touched on that, but right now we're just trying to maintain what we have. Um, there's room for improvement. We're gonna hire a new recreation program director, as I understand. So we're gonna offer more programming. I mean, we're always trying to improve and we are open to a call or a concern or a suggestion. And you can call me if nobody else wants to listen. Thank you. Mr. Watson, same question for you. Things that we don't provide that we maybe should provide or could provide. Yeah, new new features that our parks without could offer. spending more money, right? Well, <laughs> that's uh, up to you. Uh, so, I one thing I like about the park district is um, so I've been watching I've been watching you on videos and and, and the, the the park district online um, resources are the city could learn a lot by looking at what our park district does. They have great online uh, presence and you, the videos of the meetings, you can actually hear them and see them. Uh, yeah, our city could learn a few things from the park district. Um, uh, I, I know that there's money. I, I see from the website that uh, hoping to somehow use some money. I don't know where it comes from for like a it, dog park, and I don't uh, know if that's going to happen. Um, one philosophy I have of, of uh, maybe operating the park would be not coming up with something that businesses in town already do. So I don't want to compete with local businesses. I, I lean democratic. I don't know if you know, but that's something I think is important. So a golf course is fine. We already had it. its public golf course is competing with a private golf course, but. If, if we don't already have it, I don't want to start that, something that's competing with something that's already here. All right, thank you, Ms. Peterson, same question. Um, mine comes more from the programming idea, I think, instead of building more things, um, what can we be doing to enhance, enhance what we already have? Um, the uh, path, I believe it's the Pecatonica Prairie Path that um, starts from downtown Freeport and is heading towards Pecatonica and Rockford. I'm all for connectivity. Um, I don't see it as a bike path. I see it as a connecting path, a walking path. Walkers can be on it. And I'm talking about walkers. It's an older person that's pushing a walker, um, pushing strollers. Uh, it, it gets people outdoors. We have the path that goes from the Pecatonica Prairie Path. And I think even bike riders aren't even aware that it's open and it extends to um, behind big O's on the hollow on that. And I've heard so many people say, oh, is that open? I didn't even realize it was there. So promoting that and getting people that live in the area to buy into the fact that this is really a nice path that you can go out and take a walk. Um, and if they don't feel safe, why don't they feel safe? Should park police need to monitor that better? Um, I felt safe, I've ridden it by myself. Um, but I think a lot of people have the feelings of east side, west side. Um, and I think I would like to get more programming across the board. Um, I think that our golf course needs to compete with um, the Freeport Club. They are doing some absolutely fun things. Everybody wants to be there now because they're doing lots of neat things. If you get people to buy into being there, they might buy 
All right. <laughs> so Mr. Watson, the, this question will start with you. Uh, what park property do you see as underfunded and could benefit from, the, from real improvements throughout the city and throughout the park district? Oh, a year ago or two, I would have said Oakdale was, but it's been, and now I, yeah, new, there are new bike paths. If you don't know, there are multi -path, multi use paths out there much further. Um, the bike riders, I haven't even been on some of them with my dog yet, uh, but the bike riders that I've met there when I was walking have been wonderful. Uh, I don't know what the, the outcome of Taylor Park will be. I just, I'm not, uh, I was there two days ago with, with Fiona, my dog, and we met one, one man out at, with a, a cane walking that back 40, <laughs> uh, one guy. And so obviously it's, it's uh, but there's, I, there's not a lot of, I, I know there's some things that go on there. I know that the softball's there, but I, I, I don't want to say we, we need to spend more money there if, if I don't know what um, what control um, the park board has, since it's in it's it's a, basically a swamp, and that's not fully under the control of the park, as far as I, as I understand. Uh, the little parks again, yeah. Even Knowlton is uh, I rode by there a couple of days ago. There were like twenty little kids out there. Um, we could use some more of those. I, I don't know of a, a particular park that's really hurting other than Taylor Park. All right, Ms. Peterson. Sure. What park property do you see is underfunded and could benefit from some improvements? I think Taylor Park um, is needs some improvements, but again, we don't know how much that we should invest there until it's determined what aspect of the of the floodplain um, is occurring? Um, I would like to see um, brochures in Taylor Park and and Reed Park where people come in from outside of Freeport, um, and if they were on those concession stands on the inside there, that they'd be when they open up the concessions. There's all these brochures that uh, tell people about. Freeport and about the, the things that are happening around town um, to keep people in town and, and utilizing other things that are going on. Um, I've had citizens from um, the east side of Freeport residents that are concerned because the grasses are so tall on that back area that used to be the racetrack that they don't feel safe walking on it because they can't see across it or can't see if somebody is coming from behind them. So it's simple things like that that just make it um, a safer place to be. That's it right now. All right, Ms. Schwartz. Sure. Uh, what park property do you see as underfunded and that could benefit from some improvements? Well, I don't know that we do have anyone that's underfunded. As far as Taylor Park goes, we're at the mercy of the Corps of Army Engineers. Um, it's been, it's already been declared a floodplain, a floodway, excuse me. They use the term floodway. And so there isn't anything, it's out of our hands now. There's nothing that we can do there. And we, we would be throwing taxpayer money good after bad if we tried to, because it, it eventually will become a grassland as far as I, I know, I'm not sure. And as far as underfunded, we really do try to equally fund all the parks. Um, again, uh, Knowlton Park, as he mentioned, uh, we put new playground in there about five or six years ago. And we just make our rounds with all the parks. We prioritize our capital and, and we go and we do a park probably a year, you know, and that's usually the way it goes. I don't think anything is actually underfunded. And as far as establishing more, we have to maintain what we have. And we have more in this town than any other park districts in the state as far as acreage and population. You have to consider that we have to mow that stuff and we have to maintain it. And we like to maintain it to the highest standards. So that's what we're doing presently without raising taxes. 
All right, thank you. Uh, well, we'll begin with Ms. Peterson with a one minute closing statement from each candidate. I, I think Freeport is fortunate to have beautiful parks. Um, I want to see them maintained. Our executive director, our current executive director, Ron Schneider, has uh, proposed budgeting for upgrading one playground every year. You know, let's put that in the budget. And I think that's a wonderful idea. Instead of letting get anything get run down, let's start putting, let's prioritize each year and we'll put money there and the next year there. And so that we're not having to make the tough decisions of having to tear anything down. Um, I would like to see future generations enjoy our, our lovely parks. Um, I'm not going to make promises, but I am a listener. I'm out in the community a lot, um, especially now that I'm retired. And so I feel like that I would be open to listening to concerns, listening to ideas and bringing those back to our executive director and to the other board members. And I hope that you will vote for me. Thank you. All right, Ms. Schwartz. Um, well, the board is in my only community engagement. I'm also a master gardener and I have been for 12 years. And in this capacity, I volunteer in the parks um, and other public areas where we engage children in learning activities such as Earth Day and Arbor Day. We received an award just this past fall for teamwork in Crape Park um, from the Illinois Extension as Master Gardeners. Um, I'm a fiscal conservative and I feel strongly that we as a five person board must be stewards of the taxpayer dollar. The board hasn't raised taxes in eight years with all that we've done and accomplished. We have a balanced budget. And in closing, I'd like to say that I'm open to emails or calls with any concerns you may have. Our parks are vital to this community. It's a draw for people outside the community. Employers always bring new employees through our park system. And they're everything for this community. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Watson? Um, all right, I'm trying to sell myself here. <laughs> I have a wide variety of experiences. I'm, I, somebody tonight asked me, what do you do for a living? And well, I'm, I guess sometimes I'll call myself uh, uh, a struggling artist. I, I toured as a musician for, uh, maybe not quite two decades. Um, right now I'm trying to make it as a, as a woodworker, but in the, in, in the meantime, we're all raising the kids here in town and, and uh, 30 seconds. Um, I, I worked out at Highland, I, I mowed lawns, I poured concrete, I um, roofed, roofed houses. Uh, so I have a sense of what uh, people who work for the park do and what it takes to, you know, cut trees all day or to uh, sit on a lawnmower in the hot sun for 12 hours. Um, so maybe I'm valuable that way. All right, well, let's uh, applaud for all of these candidates and thank you very much. If you all wanna stand up and take a little stretch, it might take a little bit. We'll have all the HCC board candidates come up. All right. Yeah. No, I got one. Oh, I'm sorry.
So I wiped them off. So they're in. We have everybody but cool. All right. Well. We're going to get started. So let's uh, let's go. We have um, two, three, five, four. we have six candidates total running. Uh, Colton Havens couldn't be here tonight, but the the six the the total number of candidates is running for three open seats. And so I know you've all been here for the previous two rounds. And we're going to follow the same exact. Uh, pattern. So we'll start with a one minute opening statement from each of you. And we'll start with Mr. Block and then just go down the down the line and then we'll start with the questions. So go ahead, Mr. Block. Okay. I tried to borrow the stop card, but she wouldn't loan it out. I'm a I'm a lifelong resident of Carroll County. I graduated from Lanark High School and the University of Illinois with a degree in uh, um, degree from the College of Agriculture. Um, I've spent my career dairy farming, so I'm a dairy farmer uh, with my brother, and we developed a dairy farm, Hunter Haven Farm, south of Pearl City, Illinois. Um, my wife uh, took advantage of the education system here at Highland, and uh, during a change in her career, became a registered nurse, compliments of Highland Community College. I guess I have a deep respect for education, not only for my family, but for our egg industry and all of the industries and the citizens of our district. And I've had the opportunity to serve three terms on the Pearl City School Board and three terms on Highland. And I strongly believe that uh, their attitudes and working with a diverse group of people uh, with a common goal is where we need to be. All right, thank you, Ms. Grosinger. With 35 years of business and human resource experience, I know our region needs skilled labor. Working for Pearl City Elevator, we have employees and customers from all four counties that Highland serves. Highland plays a key role in training our region. Our ESL English Second Language class and our CDL truck driving program are growing. We have a robust egg program and this past year our nursing and CNC programs are also growing. Working with Freeport High School, I know we have a workforce talent right here and we need to keep building our programs. In the last 90 days, Pearl City Elevator has hired 18 new teammates, nine of those from Freeport, the city of Freeport. Of those 18 new hires, 40% have taken classes or completed certificates at Highland. I understand the need for training and jobs for our residents and Highland can do more and I am committed to working together to get that done. All right, Ms. Kaufman. My name is Mary Kaufman and I am a lifelong resident of the Freeport area. I am a full product of the Highland Community College system. I graduated from Freeport High School in 2000 and had started some classes while I was in high school and then entered the workforce because I had that opportunity. So I didn't finish my degree from Highland right away, but I did find my way back into the doors and was able to finish my degree with my Associate of Science in 2012. I continued to work throughout the time that I attended Highland and then continued on and was able to finish my four-year degree with Columbia College of Missouri, thanks to the partnership with Highland. I have attended the Leadership Institute and graduated from that in 2018. I'm very thankful for the opportunities that Highland has afforded me and appreciate everything that they have done to help me to be where I am today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ms. Potter? Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Brenda Potter. I was born and raised in the Elizabeth Hanover area. Um, I went to Northern Illinois University to get my teaching degree, which I went and then continued at River Ridge for 15 years of teaching and then received my degree at, at UW Platteville for counseling. And I've been a middle school, high school counselor there for the past 15 years. So I have over 30 years of experience in education in the past 15, specifically with Highland in that role as a high school counselor. In regards to dual credit, I believe the west side of our district does not receive the services that the east side of the district which is one reason why I'm um, running for the board. I am retiring, so I feel like I might have a little more time on my hands to be able to work on that. Um, and I hope to improve um, what Highland can offer on the west side of the district. I think there's many opportunities there. Thank you. 
All right, Ms. Williams Thomas. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Paulette Williams Thomas. I am a native of Freeport, graduate of the Freeport School District. I also have a BA degree in communication and journalism from Western Illinois University. And I am a graduate of the Highland Community College Leadership. I have been a public servant in this committee, in this community um, for a quarter of a century, 13 years with the Freeport School District Board of Education, six years as president. I've also served with the Freeport Community Foundation, the City Planning Commission, and currently um, with the Housing Authority. I have a sincere desire to see our community college remain the vital and respected educational institution that it has been for the last six years. I desire to dig in, be part of the work that makes Highland the great place that it is. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll start out with our first round of uh, questions with Ms. Grosinger. Uh, you'll have 90 seconds to answer. The, the first question is this, what do you see as a, a Highland trustee board member's role and responsibility in the effective administration of the, of the community college? And what, what particular skills do you bring to that role? I think it's extremely important that we sit at this table for the right values. And those values are our students, our taxpayers, our communities, and our industry. Okay. As a trustee, our responsibility is to be engaged. We need to show up. We need to be transparent. There is no hidden agendas, and we need to make sure that we have our priorities and values in the right place. It is not our job to get in the weeds. Our job is to make sure that we are involved in the strategic planning, which includes making sure that the curriculum is solid and it engaging. Um, and innovating, we need to make sure that the, in strategic planning, that the student experience is solid and that our employee experience is a success and that we are financially strong. As a board, we hire the president to the college and it is their responsibility to lead the team collectively. And we are, we are very focused that the only way we're going to get better and to be that leader that we expect to be is if we cross that finish line together. And it's not gonna be instant, it is a journey. We are on this together. Thank you. All right, Ms. Kaufman. I think one of the major roles of the trustee is to show up. So I think that it's important to um, create an example and also to make sure we're good stewards of the students, the educators, the communities that we serve. I think that as a trustee, I would make sure that I understood what the needs were of the communities that were served and work to try to bring the opportunities for continuing education to all of them. Um, I think that we kind of look at the three pillars of where we receive funds and see what we have for controllables. And I know that the enrollment has been down, but that's been down across all community colleges across the country. And I think that we have opportunities to continue to grow that. And as a trustee, we have to show up. I know that there are trustees that have gone to uh, many of the graduations. And I think that that's important. And it's important to just be present and um, make sure that we are supporting all that we have here and be able to continue to grow it and see it thrive for generations to come. Okay, thank you, Ms. Potter. Um, I view it just as I do currently in my job um, at River Ridge. If I'm going to be involved in education, you need to be committed to it, which means you need to be aware and read and understand all that's going on in the school. You need to understand it from all perspectives. Um, I was involved in negotiations. I've been the president of our union. There's many things that you need to know and understand when you're getting into this position. Obviously, I understand what boards are from being in an education system. So I think it's important that we are focused on what we need for the whole area. Highland is a great place. I have many of our students come to Highland um, for their uh, two-year degrees, but I think there are many opportunities out there that we should be exploring, dual credit, um, other um, options that should be made available throughout our area. It shouldn't just be the demograph demographic of where Highland's at. That should not limit it. All right, Ms. Williams-Thomas. Thank you. So the role of a trustee 
is um, the trustees are the governing bodies of colleges and universities. Um, wholeheartedly agree with Ms. Grossinger that it's not about getting in the weeds. It's about strategic planning. It's about providing oversight to the CEO and president, hiring um, presidents when that time's co time comes. Um, just being committed to that work, providing that oversight, being responsible, first of all, um, is always going to be for me, students and the needs of students first, but it's also about the faculty and staff. It's also about the community. It's about the taxpayers. It's about giving yourself to all of, all of those three categories, giving um, your best, again, being present, um, letting the community know that you're here and you're sitting on behalf of them, letting the college know, letting the students know that you're working on their behalf. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kaufman, the question will go to you first. Uh, how should Highland Community College address the fact that there's a diminishing number of incoming students throughout? The I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got it. Well, I can just say ditto to what everyone else <laughs> uh, <laughs> with, with that, the, the primary role of, of, on the Board of Trustees is indeed to hire the president and, the, and help the president establish the goals and, and the direction that the Highland College is going. And I couldn't believe stronger in that. I think the other issue, or not issue at all, the other obligation of the, the Board of Trustees is to understand the mission of Highland Community College, which is to provide an educational opportunity for all the citizens of the district that we have. And with that, you know, you have the day-to-day -day issues and, and also the responsibility to establish a strategic plan and try to look ahead and including questions like the next question we're going to answer. And last but not least is our financial responsibility. Um, today, the state only funds 10% of our college. Um, it's supposed to be one third from the state, one third from the students and one third from the taxpayers. Um, it's approximately 10% uh, from the state, uh, uh, over 50% from our taxpayers, and the students uh, get the remainder along with the wonderful organizations that we have and the support that we can garner uh, from organizations like our Highland Foundation. So um, everything that everyone else said, I couldn't agree with more. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Kaufman. How should Highland Community College address the fact that there's a diminishing number of incoming students throughout the district? And how would you boost that number of students from a non-traditional demographic? I can't start that with ditto, but <laughs> um, as I mentioned earlier, I do think that diminishing um, enrollment is an issue that is more than just at Highland. Um, as somebody that has taken classes both toward a degree and also through the lifelong learning. I think that we have opportunities to continue to partner with various businesses and community members that we can continue to expand the already wonderful lifelong learning courses. I mean, if you want to learn history, you can take a lifelong learning class. If you want to learn to cook, you can take a lifelong learning class. If you want to learn to crochet, you want to learn about computers. I guarantee you, if you have an interest, there's probably a class for it. And if not, I'm sure that there's an opportunity that one can be created. I do think that we have opportunities to get the information out there in order to increase enrollment. I think there's also an opportunity to create classes that are a bit of a mix of the traditional course and a lifelong learning class. Maybe there's opportunities for classes that are not going to be a graded class toward a degree, but a pass fail opportunity that we could continue to expand upon to allow all of us to continue the wonderful journey that is learning that does continue throughout our entire lives. Thank all you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Potter. Um, as I said before, I think that we have plenty of opportunity in our district to gain uh, the money because of the, di the diminishing enrollment. I do, do believe that is due to some of the things that have disappeared on the west side. Um, you can look at when the enrollment went down and it is in relation to some of those things. 
I do believe that you're competing across the district for students to come here. Students start their freshman year now, if not earlier, starting to look at what they're going to do. And then you, you need to be putting out there to get those students here to have experiences. The quicker you can have, I remember when I was in high school, we came and watched a play here. I don't see that happening. I've not seen those opportunities. You put students here, they see what it is, they will come. You put faculty out in the west side to help and have some dual credit, you will increase the number of students who come here. In 2016, when we had the largest dual credit, I had the largest number of students come from our district here. It's definitely an area we can improve on. And I know it's across the board. I know this across the state and the nations that, that enrollment is going down in the community colleges, but I think we need to look to try and improve where we can improve. All right, Ms. williams Thomas. Again, enrollment decline is not unique to Highland. It is happening in junior colleges all over the state and all over the country. And then of course, we are particularly behind as we try to um, recover from the pandemic. But um, the college can do many things in its, in its course offerings and the audience that it reaches. Um, we need to focus, continue to focus on building the brand. I don't know how many of you have seen the It's All Here campaign that Highland has put out um, as part of the celebration of the 60th anniversary, but it's an awesome campaign that needs to reach people. Recruitment can be increased. Um, I know we recruit athletes, but what are the, the ways we're reaching traditional students? What are the ways we're reaching those students who want um, trades and to want to get certifications for different jobs? Um, one thing we have to do is keep up with the times. Those who are considered traditional students, high school students, young adults, they don't want a pamphlet to read. They want digital means. They're going to Google Highland Community College. They're going to see what's on the website, what's on the internet about Highland. We have to appeal to them in the way that they like to be communicated to. All right, Mr. Block. Well, I, <clears throat> I think we have to acknowledge the constant change that we have um, in today's society and what's happening in today's society and be aware of that and adopt, adapt to that. Personally, <clears throat> and the college recognizes that we need to make Highland Community College a destination. We've been able and, and through donations of the foundation, the nursing program is exceptional. We are I'm aware that we're drawing students in from outside of the district. The agricultural program is the same. We may need to make it a destination for people to want to come here. And then, as, as it was just previously mentioned, it's all here. We need to market our program, so to speak. Many times I, I, I hesitate to say that our community college is somewhat like a business, but it, in many aspects, it really is. We need to figure out a way and Highland is working on it, but to make more and more people know that it is all here and the advantages they can have. And we've done it, um, Highland has done it through many different types of programs along with the programs that I just mentioned. Uh, um, dual credit, uh, adult ed, we're offering more online courses, all the things we're doing to try to keep up with our fast paced educational changes. Thank you. Ms. Grosinger. So I'm going to take you down the business road again, because I think there's a lot of strength if we work with our businesses. Um, and when we work with our businesses and figure out the training needs that they have, whether we're reinventing a non-traditional student um, or whether we're training someone who used to have a job yesterday, but they don't today, Highland is a gem in regards to that. We just need to keep pushing that envelope to figure out what businesses need. Um, I'm a firm believer in the concept and, you know, it's gonna, it's a work in progress, but how do we collectively work with our area high schools and get our faculty feet on the ground at the high schools? So we're talking about Highland. We're making sure that we're sharing our expertise um, and our faculty is amazing. They're very experienced. So how can we broaden that? And that's, that's going to take a big investment. 
I think it's super important that hybrid classes, that's, that is here to stay. Um, I think there's a, a big win when we can meet the students' needs in hybrid classes from a Belvis, Belvedere student who can do some of their studies online, but then they're still coming to the campus here. It's super important, and I loved what Highland did with the International Women's Day. They had eight different schools here, grade schools and high schools, but here to participate in the choir concert for um, International Women's Day. That's fantastic. Those are the things that we need to do so that our students know about Highland and what we have to offer. All right, thank you. Ms. Potter, this, this question will start with you, and you've all addressed this a little bit. But um, how can Highland Community College improve their footprint throughout the entire district? Um, as I've already stated, I think there are many opportunities out there. Um, I, I think getting your high school students on campus somehow, some way, um, I think it's important to get Highland out to uh, the all the schools in our district. Um, having um, them on the ground is very important. I think it does speak to have dual credit. Parents are always asking for those dual credit courses. And I think that's a very important way because I think that is a way that if a student gets a portion of those done, they're gonna come here and finish the other year. It's, a, it's a kind of a no brainer on that. But I think moving forward, Highland has to think a little bit outside of the box. I, I'm outside the box. I was actually on the strategic planning committee last time as a high school counselor. And I think they do need to listen to what their high schools are telling them as well on um, what needs to be done to help Highland. We're the ones that have the students coming here. We know what the students are looking for. I think they need to listen and I think they need to span out and find out from those schools what, need, what we need. Um, I think they sometimes do that in some ways, but I think there's room for improvement on that. Thank you, Ms. Williams-Thomas. Can you repeat the question, sure. Mr. Winker? Sure. Uh, how could Highland Community College improve their footprint throughout the entire district? Thank you. Um, many great answers already given. Again, I go back to that, that branding that uniqueness that is Highland. How do we share that with our community? How do we share that um, with the high schools? That relationship is extremely important between the college and the school districts, between the college and the business partners, between the college and the community, between um, building those relationships will also strengthen the foundation, providing more financial opportunities um, for students to come to Highland. I don't know if you've ever been to um, the scholarship day here, but there are many, many financial opportunities um, for students, but they need to know about it. They need to be encouraged um, to apply for it. So I just think building the community the four, it's, and of course, it's not just Freeport, as Brenda has stated, those four counties, and we need to be meeting the needs of the students across those four counties. Thank you, Mr. Block. Well, I, I think our footprint, of course, involves the local high schools and working with the students, dual credit, um, Highland having the ability to take classes out to the school districts if they possibly can. But I, I think that's just part of it. We have to face the reality that we are having fewer and fewer students graduating from our rural community and we are losing population. I think the thing that we, in my opinion, and it's part of our strategic plan, I believe that we need to increase our partnerships. We need to work more with our businesses to see what we can collaborate on. When a business hires an executive or somebody to come into the community, the, ed the educational system is a big part of their being able to hire people. And I think they need to uh, also, and we need to work more with the businesses and see what we can collaborate on because it's just not student population. And then many of the other things that we talked about earlier, the uh, um, adult education, the um, all of the, the other things that we can possibly do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grosier. You bet. Um, it takes all of us to get this done. I could not be prouder of the Highland Community College Foundation. Um, they are 
working hand in hand with the community college. That effort is one more team member that's out touching the communities, whether it's in Galena or whether it's um, down in Mount Carroll or Savannah or North in Dakota. So the foundation relationship is a, is a huge thing for us. Lifelong learning. Um, I can't tell you the number of, of folks from Galena that I visit with that love the history program that is taught in Galena through lifelong learning. It's fantastic. We have people that are tourists that come out to Galena and they want to learn about the history. So there's a gem there. So it's not just one answer. It's a collective thing. When you look at the servant leadership program that our area high schools bring, it is truly moving. And I've been here on several of their events. When you see these young people have the energy and the excitement about helping others, that's what it's about. We're laying that foundation for what the future is. And then from the, the Highland team, we need to look at things different. It's not always going to be a certificate. Maybe it's one class that this business needs so that that employee has the skill set that they need. So thinking um, outside of the box, my motto is get away from the box as far as you can, because we have to do things different. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kaufman. Can you repeat the full question one more sure. time? Sure. Uh, how can Highland Community College improve their footprint throughout the entire district? I will repeat what some of the others have said. Um, Highland isn't just Stevenson County. It's Joe Davis County. It's Ogle County. It's Carroll County. And it's beyond that. We have a lot of opportunity, and we have to remember that it does cover more than just Stevenson County. Um, one of my favorite classes that I took at Columbia, and I will admit, Columbia, I did primarily online, but my favorite class was History of Business, which was actually taught in Salt Lake City, Utah, in seat, and then I was by Zoom along with a few other students. And I see that as an opportunity to improve the opportunities of distance. Um, it wasn't great that it was from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Monday evenings, mountain time, which meant that it was even later here. But it was one of my favorite courses, and it was the lecture that drew me in. I think I took five pages of notes every single class. And I see that as an opportunity to be able to not only potentially have instructors here, on campus that could be broadcasting through Zoom to Joe Davis County, to Iowa, to Montana, to wherever we can reach because there's so many opportunities that digital has afforded us to cross those barriers of distance and geography. So I think that we can implement some of that, but also just continuing to get the word out and bringing Highland to those other areas and being available and accessible to the additional counties. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, the last question this round, will, we'll start with Ms. Williams-Thomas. What kind of additions, uh, maybe physical things or, or community things would you like to change uh, at Highland within the next few years to attract new students? And specifically, what's your view of the discussion about building a new sports complex to replace the use of the YMCA by Highland Community College? There are so many wonderful things already happening at Highland. Um, my goal in being a trustee would be to work as one member of the board of trustees to build on that. I don't come with a specific agenda that I want to add something, that I want to change something. I come wanting to be a part of the process to make this college one of the best community colleges, not just in Illinois, but in the entire country. Um, I have heard buzz about the sports complex. Um, I don't know very much about it. I don't know enough about the purpose of building a new sports complex, how it will be funded and how it will be maintained to take a side at this time, but I'm definitely anxious to hear more. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Block? Well, I, I admire the uh, 
protocol that the park district has had and that they they work on the different park areas year to year and i think i've seen the same issues at highland uh, we've had the the nursing program that's been updated the agriculture program that's been updated our lab many of our lab and science programs have, have been updated i think uh, our sports facilities is it certainly needs to be in that agenda now with that am i in favor of an event center absolutely wonderful but then i immediately go to my uh, uh farmer mentality and say how are we going to pay for it and then if we do pay for it if somebody donated the whole facility to us can we afford to operate it year after year after year so i know the college is doing a feasibility study on it there are many questions to be asked uh, am i in favor of it absolutely but can we afford it and what are the steps that we can take and can we do something in moderation are there other areas of the college need to be updated i think it's an ongoing basis we need to keep up with it we need to be involved absolutely thank you miss grosinger i think it's extremely important that we take care of the gift that we have um, and that's that constant investment so one of the most recent investments that we did was we took a look at the auto body shop our numbers were dropping there. We reinvented that into a state-of-the-art welding um, facility, which we have students that um, are lined up to take welding, which is a skill that they can take anywhere. So it's that repurposing and investment it's, that is extremely important to me. Um, I wanna make sure that we get people here you know, the conversation about a bike path going through Highland. I love that. I want people to see what we have here to offer, getting the, the high school and the grade school students on campus so they can see what is here. Again, is another win. Um, the feasibility study, I, I want to learn more. I honestly don't know enough about the conversation with the sports complex, but we will get that information that we need so that we can make a sound decision. And when we sit at that table, you have to be informed. You've got to ask the questions and you've got to understand how are we investing our taxpayers' dollars and how are they benefiting the students and the communities that we serve? All right, Ms. Kaufman. I'm going to ask you to repeat that one. No again. problem. What kind of additions would you make maybe physically to the campus or just to the campus community within the next few years to attract new students? And specifically, what's your view of the discussion to build a new sports complex to replace the use of the YMCA by HCC? I think that we do have a beautiful campus. We do have beautiful facilities. Um, I've been able to tour the nursing um, wing and I know that there are a lot of updates that are coming um, as others have mentioned with the park district they've got a great model where they're continuing to update every single year and I think that Highland does a good job of continuing to make updates as necessary and make changes where necessary as uh, Ms. Grosinger referenced they took the auto body program that was starting to dwindle a little bit and adapted it to become more of a welding program and CNC and develop and expand that. And that's exciting. Um, they've made changes when we needed to offer the wind turbine program. And we kind of worked ourselves out of that program because almost everybody in the area that services those was probably trained here. And as far as the sports complex, um, I think that there are some potential upgrades needed for the YMCA and having the sports complex could potentially bring additional dollars. It could bring additional awareness and attention to our college. Um, so I am in favor of it. I think that everybody brought up a good point too. We have to understand, can we afford it and can we afford to sustain it? I think those are very, very important things that need to be addressed and reviewed to understand fully um, what the project entails. All right, Ms. Potter. Um, I'll go to the campaign that was referenced earlier. It's all here. Um, I think something that Highland is desperately needing is housing. I think they need to come up with something like NICC has come up with, which is phenomenal. And it is, we're losing students that way because of it, to try and find housing, um, to set up some form of what they've done like at NICC, I think would be a huge thing for Highland. 
um, a, a sports complex, again, if you can afford it, um, in my opinion, I think a housing situation would be something more you want to look at um, in like the pod situation. That's what an ICC has. I think that would be something that would really attract students from beyond here. Um, I think moving forward and, and knowing what students are looking for, and I can tell you from my experience, that's what they want. They want something like that to move into. They're all, they have all the furniture there. They have everything. That's my opinion on that. What might be the big attraction? It's all here. I think it would go awesome with that campaign. All right, thank you. Well, we'll start with Mr. Block with uh, one minute closing statements. Well, my family and, and our business um, and has been a <clears throat> huge beneficiary of education. And I guess my, my goal, my pay it back, so to speak, is to be get involved with education and see that it, uh, it still is available to the citizens of this area and that it stays sustainable. And that falls right in with the mission of Highland Community College is to, in providing educational opportunities for all the residents of this district. Um, we have to face our day-to-day -day decisions. We have to make good strategic plans and we have to be financially responsible to keep this college sustainable uh, for, the, for, the, for the foreseeable future. So it is our future and I couldn't agree more. It's all here in the Highland Community College, but let's make it all, it's all here in our community. Thank you, I appreciate your support. Thank you, Ms. Grosinger. I represent Highland on the National Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. Um, I believe strongly that everyone deserves a seat at the table that they and their family helped to build. Highland has worked hard to implement programs that touch the lives of the underserved. Um, one of the best kept secrets is that Highland works with the Thompson Prison and provides a welding certificate program. And I've attended those graduation ceremonies with tears. And if you wanna be moved beyond words, attend the GED graduation ceremony, which I have every year of my term. Highland is training our region's workforce. We have added even more training um, transfer program agreements with four-year universities, and we're not done. And I need your help and your support so I can continue to make a difference. I am living out my values of believing in making it better for those that I serve. I listen, I learn, I work collectively, and I am here to be the change. Thank you. All right, Ms. Kaufman. I wanna thank everyone that came out tonight and those that will end up watching this later on Zoom or that are currently watching. I think it's very important for people to become informed about those that they um, have the option to vote for. And as someone that is the president elect for our local Kiwanis Club, I'm the current um, financial secretary for the Freeport Public Library, and I've served on other various boards. I would love the opportunity to also serve as a Highland Community College trustee in order to give back to the very place that has contributed to all of the areas that I've been able to touch and all of the jobs that I've been able to hold throughout my entire life so far. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Potter. Um, I obviously have a passion for education. I've done this my entire life. Um, I believe this is something that I could serve very well at. I think I have a handle on what students are looking for. I think I've served on both sides. I know what we need here at Highland and I feel like the conversation needs to continue. I think you need to listen to your people in your district and bring to them what they are asking for. I appreciate your vote, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams-Thomas. Thank you to each of you who came out tonight to our virtual listeners. Um, thank you. Technology is amazing. You made the right decision tonight by coming here. You need to be informed voters. Voting is not about popularity. It's not about party. It's about putting the right people in the right seats for the good of our city, our community, this college, the district, the other districts that are involved in the college. I desire your vote on April 1st, April 4th, don't go on the 1st. <laughs> I have a heart for education, a passion for people, have served this community for 25 years and I'm not tired yet. 
It's all here at Highland and I'm here for it. Hey, well, thank you all. All right, now we'll have the candidates for Freeport School District Board come up. Mr. Block. What? Well, I didn't. I forgot. I skipped Mr. Block. If I was doing good, I wouldn't have done that. All right, we're going to get the school board members up, school board member candidates up. While they take their seats, we'll take our seats. All right. Well, I think we have one, two, three. We have eight of the nine people running for school board. I think that's correct, based on the list I have. Seven, Jean Howard, did she send a representative? Oh, Ella Edison, I'm sorry. Did Ella Edison send a representative or Jean Howard to, say, to make a statement? Okay, all right then. So we have Mr. Chapman and Mrs. First. Yes, sir. Ms. First, yes, sorry. Sir, Martha. Martha, all right. We, we, they weren't exactly sure who would make it today. So we'll uh, do that. Mr. Huber, all right? Yes. Ms. Moore Howard, Mr. Myers, Ms. Seal, and Mr. Sosnowski. Okay. Well, we're going to begin with uh, one minute opening statements from each of the candidates, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Chapman. Hello, my name is Tim Chapman. I've been a Freeport resident since 2006. I have two children in the district. I operate three businesses in town, Chapman Properties, Advanced Tubby Finishing, and Tim's Tree Service. Through management of my business, I have a very clear vision for the changes that need to be implemented to make Freeport a more attractive place to live, start a business, or start a career. I believe that the basis of this vision requires community involvement, accountability, attentive students, passionate teachers, receptive administration and a dedicated staff. If we're gonna prosper, we must have immediate change. Okay, thank you, Martha. 
I'm Martha First, a 1980 graduate of Freeport High School, and very thankful this forum is being held tonight and that everybody came out or on Zoom. My family uh, has always been advocates and students in the Freeport Public Schools. I'm actually the fourth generation of the first family to serve on the school board. I have a sister and cousins who are teachers, and in my book, teachers are the first responders of education, the first immediate caretakers and champions on the scene. Educating our children is not a partisan issue. Wanting our students to excel is universally shared. I want to, I want to serve for a second term on the school board to keep good momentum going in the district. Our achievement scores are not sufficient, but the rate of growth and improvement is accelerating. And the board and I helped to recruit Dr. Anna Alvarado as superintendent. She's driven the strong change through school improvement plan, curriculum and policies change. Let's keep moving the district forward. Okay, Mr. Huber. Hello, good evening. And thank you for everybody who's attending here or virtual. Uh, my name is Lynn Huber. I'm the owner of Fact Fitness here in Freeport. Uh, I bring a championship level of athletic performance training. Um, prior, I've coached eight years of college football. Um, the teams I've been a part of have been to bowl games and we've won championships. In 2001, uh, I had the number one defense in the country uh, in the National Junior College Athletic Association. Also, I spent seven years in the Army National Guard with math proficiency as low as 11%, reading 16% within the last four years. Uh, our kids need help. Uh, and, that's, and that's why I'm running to help these kids out. Uh, Freeport School District statewide performance in 2022 is at 12% and Freeport ranks 718 out of 819 schools. I'm here to bring a winning culture and uh, significantly raise the bar. Thank you. All right, Ms. Moore Howard. Good evening. My name is Audrey Moore Howard. I am a lifelong resident of Freeport. I am a graduate of the Freeport School District. I am um, a retired employee of 27 years from the district. I am running for school board for, you can say reasons or whys. Um, number one, uh, student uh, academics. I believe that every student should receive a fair and equal um, educational experience as well as disciplinary um, outcomes. My second reason is for um, our staff, all staffs uh, for fair wages. I believe that they should be receiving wages that are comparable to other school districts our size. And number three, our taxpayers. I believe our taxpayers, especially our elderly taxpayers should not be burdened with uh, rising taxes. And so that's my reason and my why for running for the school board. Okay, thank you, Mr. Myers. Hi, I'm Dennis Myers, and I'm gonna give you a bio of where I've been because that will tell you where I wanna go. I moved here in 1970 and worked as a PE teacher for 30 years. I had five certifications in supervisory, health education, physical education, administration, K-8 classroom, and special education behavior disorder. I taught six years in Rockford as a special education teacher in disorders. I was married to my wife, Sandra, and had two sons. I coached a junior tackle, little league, prep baseball, indoor and outdoor soccer, and helped whenever I could. My wife and I owned and managed rental units and also roofed many houses during the summer. My late wife went to college at age 36 and in four years was a certified teacher. She taught 16 years as a first grade teacher at Blackhawk School. Right. Casey Seal. Good evening, my name is Casey Seal. I was born and raised here in Freeport also a graduate of Freeport High School myself. Um, I currently am married and have two children enrolled in Freeport schools. I'm a local business owner and very dedicated to serving my community. I've worked with children off and on most of my life in many different capacities, and I have a very strong desire to make a difference in the lives of children. A um, Couple of the reasons that I wanna run, there's many, but I'll just give you two. To be a voice for our students, to be an advocate for our teachers, 
I think it is vital that we make sure that our teachers and staff and all the educators have the support that they need, the tools that they need, and the resources that they need. I think it's equally important that we make sure as a board that the children and our students are at the forefront of every single decision that's made. All right, Mr. Jack Sosnowski. Well, thank you. My name is Jack Sosnowski and I'm seeking your support for my reelection. I've had the privilege of calling Freeport uh, home for the last 30 years. My wife and two kids were born and raised in Freeport and I'm proud to say that we're a pretzel family. I work as an executive leader uh, for the last 36 years for multiple different uh, corporations. And now I work for a private equity company that bought one company here in Freeport, but my role is to integrate several companies into one company and make it a bigger and stronger place. I've been asked to uh, really drive the integration of the team. And uh, we have a lot of good things to uh, deliver to this community. I currently serve as the school board president and the chairperson of the finance committee. And you ask, what is my why? We've started a transformation here in Freeport. The work's not done. It's not even close to being done. There's a lot of things that we need and I'm very passionate about the work in the district and I'm very passionate about the team itself. And this poor young lady is gonna have a complex for throwing up that sign. <laughs> so we're at a critical juncture and we need your support. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, well, you all have about 90 seconds. Uh, you'll have 90 seconds to answer these four questions. We'll kind of go down the road to start. And uh, the first question will go to Mr. Chapman first. Uh, why are you running for this position? What do you see as the school board member's role and responsibility in the effective administration of schools? And what particular skills do you bring to the role? I wanna make, I wanna help Freeport, make Freeport a great place to live. We have a history of which town that has great untapped potential. I see this by being involved with the community every day to change the character of our town, uplifting and motivating the next generation is a great place to start. I feel that my skills developing employees would greatly help um, my role as a board member. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martha. Well, I will be hopefully get a chance to start a second term on the school board. And the board, um, actually there are a lot of good descriptions of this with the Highland candidates about it being oftentimes uh, the role of the board to be the, the hiring or uh, compensation or everything with respect to the superintendent but then also approval of strategic plans, of budgets, uh, financial oversight and the audit. I served with Jack on the finance committee as well as the equity committee. Um, and uh, one of the most difficult things we do for me is uh, we do discipline and expulsion hearings. Um, my heart has a tough time with that one, although we always do what's in the student's best interest. As far as personal skills, um, I'm kind of a mix of things. I uh, have an MBA and have finance and business in my background. Uh, I've served on many boards, including uh, being very active at Grace Episcopal Church, but I also feel I bring some unique perspective on the mental health front. I serve on the 708 board. I've had personal experience with working with mental health and it's critical to our students, even more so coming out of the pandemic. And I'm fortunate that we're working as a district with a number of mental health providers. Um, I guess that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Huber. Yes, my reason for running for uh, school board is first and foremost to be a voice for the students. They're the ones that uh, if us as the adults can't stand up for them, obviously they're not gonna be able to stand up for themselves. So uh, when I have uh, these young folks come into my gym, um, they, they bring concerns into me. Uh, and I'll give you an example of this. I've got a young man who is a sophomore um, taking a industrial arts type class. Uh, there's nine students in that class. Um, three of the students know how to read a tape measure and break down um, fractions. 
six of them, the other six have no clue. Uh, according to what he says, they don't even want to be there. That's an issue. So we have 6.3, or excuse me, the three that want to be there are getting pulled down. They're, they're not learning. I want to be that voice to make sure they get heard, that they, um, we, we could advance their learning. Uh, second of all, I want to rep, I, I'm here for safety. Um, the young man that, uh, the young guy that uh, has to hold his water all day because he can't get to the, because he doesn't want to go to the bathroom because he's scared he's going to get bullied and beat up. I want to be the voice for that young man because he needs a voice. Um, other than, so I work with kids all day. That's my passion. Uh, I want to stand in and also help teachers become a be better version of themselves also. Okay, Ms. Moore Howard. Well, I did already give my reasons or my whys, um, but my passion is with children. I have a degree in business administration, but I never utilized that because I always wanted to be um, a service to the kids. And I felt if I was stuck in one place um, all the time, I would not be able to, to utilize um, my skills as far as listening and um, being a problem solver. Um, I, I believe that with the passion that I have for kids, I can help them be successful. Um, the second part to that question, um, what do I bring to the table? Again, I, I, I'm a good listener. I'm a good problem solver. Um, I believe that um, it just takes one. All we need to do is just reach out and, and get a hold of one. And if we can help that one, then that one can help that one. And then the, the cycle continues. All right, thank you. Dennis Myers. Would you like to repeat the question? Sure. Why are you running for this position and what do you see as the school board member's role and responsibility in the effective administration of schools? And what skills do you bring to the role? Thank you. Uh, my main focus is on reading. He brought up the fact that the schools, the students are about 17% proficient in reading in this school district. That is terrible. I uh, taught Orton Gillingham system of reading to dyslexic students. And it was very powerful. First off, because I was successful. Second, because the students were successful. If you see the growth in their personality, the growth in their self-esteem and see how they improve their lives, I wish our school district would have that same passion that I do. I bring that I'm educated. I have a lot of experience in teaching, a lot of experience in working with the students. I would like to be a voice for the parents. We talk about everyone else and they're all important, but the parents also are an important segment that needs to be heard. They need to have a voice because if you listen to them, a lot of parents are not happy with the Freeport School District. They're not happy with the education system. And I don't know how I will be able to make all those changes, but I'm sure I can make a small change and being dedicated and know there's a problem is a start. Thank you. All right, thank you. Casey Seal. Okay, three-parter. Why? Basically to serve and make a difference, kind of like I explained. But as far as my individual role on the school board, first and foremost, I recognize that as an individual of the school board, I have absolutely no legal authority or power. The school board only operates as a whole. Um, to represent, my job would be to represent all district constituents, honestly, equally, to make decisions based on need instead of want. Um, I. I know that it's, it's hard sometimes that you can get complacent in a position and not ask the hard questions. I think that's kind of comes with the job. You have to have the discussions and ask the hard questions as a school board member, and you have to continue to learn. Um, I think I would be good because I care. I have a lot of different backgrounds and come from different work experiences, everything from a preschool assistant teacher to camp counselor to all the way up in the corporate world where I was a director of sales and marketing for a big company um, to now where I work in the service industry as a hairdresser here locally for the last decade plus. Um, I always strive to be incredibly well-informed. 
I consider myself to be a little bit of an information nerd. I love to gather information and obtaining information from different sources, learning from different community members is an excellent way to educate yourself, to be a little bit more knowledgeable about the issues. And that's something that I'm committed to doing. All right, thank you, Mr. Sosnowski. Well, thank you again. My main reason is the kids, pure and simple, it's the kids. I was blessed to have a wonderful education and a wonderful experience, but a lot of our kids are, don't have that same element. I wanna pay it forward. I am a servant leader and I do need to pay this forward. It's all about the kids and we can't forget that. The board itself sets the policy. We govern the district, all right? We don't go onto the floor and teach. We don't have the skill set to do that. Our teachers are awesome to do that. They've been trained and educated. We set the policies in the district. We have one employee and that's Dr. Alvarado, one employee. We are the stewards of our district. We're the stewards of our kids. We're the stewards of the community and the taxpayer. You know, one of the key elements that we've done is we've enabled the district with the resources and things that they need because of the funding that we were able to reallocate and resupply. Yes, funding. Funding that the state said, you know what, we're not gonna pay you your one categorical payment out of four, but we still hit our budget. This is about supporting the teachers and giving the teachers everything that they need to educate our kids. And first and foremost, it's about making sure that we have a safe learning environment so our kids can learn and grow. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Well, uh, Martha, you're gonna get the first, first bite at the next question. Uh, what do you see as the greatest current challenge facing the district uh, as a school district and then in partnership with the community as well? Now, we know that the school district is an important part of the community, but kind of keep the focus on the school district first and then how the school district integrates with the community. I think this is a great, a, a great question because so goes the school district, so goes the community and vice versa. We are in this together. Um, I think the biggest challenge is in fact, um, academic achievement rates. We're accelerating, but we really need to um, continue to build that. And we've taken steps towards that. I think the demographics of Freeport have changed over the years, certainly since I grew up here. And if you look at the demographic data in terms of poverty, in terms of different ethnicities, um, and it's just a very different place to be. And teachers and other staff members are often asked to play a role beyond just educator. You can't ask them to do everything, but believe me, people are in positions where they care about the students and wanna help. Um, I think as the community of Freeport goes and its economic engine grows, then that will benefit obviously the tax base, um, which is a win-win for everybody. I think that, um, but we have to have attractive schools in order to attract business. So I, I'm very much a believer that the two are intertwined. Um, I have hope for the district or I wouldn't be here. And I have hope for this community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Huber. In your opinion. The sure. Uh, what do you see as the greatest current challenge facing the school district? And then uh, how do you see the school district and the community working on the common challenges that they share. Okay, the, the issue I see most is where we're at with test scores and, and education and uh, competency. Uh, you know, when our math, uh, uh, you know, when, when our proficiency is as low as 11% and our reading is as low as 16%, uh, we have an issue because uh, if we're that low, we don't have employable people, frankly. And the good kids, unfortunately, are gonna leave the district. They're leaving the district. I can tell you that right now in my business, I have multiple kids that are going to Byron, they're going to Pecatonica, uh, they're going to schools in Rockford. This, this is a problem. We're not gonna have a tax base if we keep on this, uh, if, if we can't uh, 
um, raise the bar. If we don't change the culture in this community, we have to have a winning uh, attitude. We have to have a winning culture. And right now that bar is on the ground. We got to pick that bar up and raise it up. All right, thank you, Ms. Moore Howard. I think there are two areas that um, we need to concentrate on. One being uh, academic excellence and then hiring and retention of our teachers. Um, those are two main problems that we're having right now. If we can get everyone engaged, um, I remember growing up, they would say that it takes a community to, uh, it takes a village to raise a, a child. I think we need to get back to that concept. Um, we do have a lot of community involvement, but we do need to have more community involvement. If we have people that would come in and tutor or um, mentor, um, I think that it would also help with the academic excellence. Um, they need to see before they can do it. They, they can believe it, but they need to see it. And until you can see something happening, you're not going to really make an attempt to do it. So we need to work on those two things, academic excellence, and teacher hiring and retention. Okay, thank you, Mr. Myers. Once again, I wanna get back. Reading is the thing that we need to focus on. We cannot bring in new businesses without higher scores. The management doesn't wanna come here. The businesses can't be successful here without having students that have the skills that they need. We give away grades instead of earn grades. We pass people on, we promote them without being um, competent. This does not bring up students. You have to build a self-image. You have to build that. And you do that by having higher standards and hold students accountable. Um, I think it, what everybody else says is true, but we just need to focus better. Uh, my wife would go in, she's been to the school board meetings, she was going to go look at the new reading curriculum that's going to be offered or used. This is for the first grade level. One of the series, they were going to have talk about hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics, that's not something we need. The next series was going to talk about going out for fish and chips and looking up, oh, there's Big Ben. I think that we're here in America. We could talk about the Statue of Liberty. We could talk about the politicians here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Casey Seal? Okay, well, I agree with Audrey that teacher retention is a major issue. I also agree with Martha that our Test, score, test scores and our children's educational growth is a big issue, but I'm gonna go above that and say student behaviors. I think student behaviors affect both of those things. I know for a fact that student behaviors and discipline are one of the reasons that teachers are leaving the profession. I know that student behaviors and lack of discipline is one of the reason why, reasons why other children struggle in the classroom. It's taking away from in instructional time with the teachers to be diverted over here with discipline issues when we don't have, and we don't necessarily have an effective system in place to discipline, which is not necessarily our, our district's fault. I mean, I don't know if a lot of people realize that the rules laid out for discipline come mostly from the state. There was a bill that was passed and it's very specific on some things you can and cannot do. So regarding the community, what is, what's it gonna take if our hands are tied or teachers feel like their hands are tied and regarding discipline because of the state says certain things, we need parent involvement. And how are we gonna get that? I'm, it, it's, it's tricky. You know, how do you make parents involved that sometimes don't wanna be there? I think that there's a, there's a policy in place for parent involvement. I think it needs to be enforced and implemented a little bit better. There's some key points here about keeping parents engaged. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Sesnowski. Well, thank you. <clears throat> you know, for us, uh, we've talked about academic achievement and that is right smack dab in the middle of everything that we do. But I think it's also something that, you know, we want to focus, need to focus on student specific student focused outcomes. 
looking at individuals as individuals and working with those kids the way that our teachers do. The other element too is around cultural awareness and tolerance. So those are some three big chunks, but ultimately it's about giving the kids an education and to raise those scores and to give them a fighting chance for what this world is going to be in the next three, five and 10 years. On the actual physical side, it's about resources and people we cannot find good qualified people. Do you know that every day I get a call to see if we have enough bus drivers to take our kids to school? Every day, because we cannot get good bus drivers. That's a whole nother level. Same with the teachers. You know how difficult it is? We have over 300,000 vacancies for teachers, right? So we're doing everything that we can to attract new teachers, new staff into this district. And I'll tell you a couple of different things. When and now that we're doing some really good stuff in the district, we're starting to attract those people that want to be part of our story and our turnaround in this district. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chapman. I would like to kind of piggyback on uh, what Lynn was talking about. I feel that uh, pretty much I agreed with everything he said. I would like to add that uh, 145 has a tax rate of 7.56% and a 77% graduation rate. Our Illinois average is an 87% graduation rate. Harlem 122 has a tax rate of 6.85%. Their graduation rate is 82%. Lee Wynn, 4.78% tax rate, graduation rate is 91%. Forreston, 5.02 tax rate, graduation rate 95%. Eastland, 4.22% tax rate, 96% graduation rate. Following the community model of our neighbors would be a great place to start. All right, thank you. Mr. Huber, you get the first bite at this question. Uh, we've touched on this a little bit, some of you, but this gives you all a chance to focus on this topic specifically. Uh, given the incidents, incidences of school violence throughout the country and shootings, what's your strategy or policy for keeping students safe at school? and address your beliefs on policy for student discipline. First of all, as far as this, the uh, school violence goes, it's a major problem. Um, it's not always fair to dump this problem on the, on the teachers. Teachers are here to educate people. And I know we, we do have some teachers that are able to do more. We, we have stronger individuals that can break up the fights, can, can separate these kids. Other instances, we have uh, teachers getting injured and just by being in the way. So we need more um, truancy officers, more peace officers uh, that are gonna help break things up when, when things happen. But uh, one of the things we need is um, if you want, we, actions and consequences. So uh, we need, for, for the kids that are causing these issues, we gotta come down on them. I mean, we, we just have to, there has to be consequences if we ever wanna change behavior. So that's something that is first and foremost necessary. Um, second of all, if we need a metal detector, something like that, that's probably, that is definitely a good way to go. So we may need some things like that. But, uh, uh, you know, we've got to instill discipline at an early age so we have great outcomes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Moore Howard. Could you repeat the question again, sure. please? Uh, given the incidences of school violence uh, throughout the country, what's your strategy or policy for keeping students safe at school? And describe your beliefs on student discipline. The first thing is, um, when you look at a situation that a student is involved in, you have to understand sometimes they come from those situations at home. So they mimic what they see. We need to get past, um, I believe, the violent or the behavior and try to help mentally um, what is going on, emotionally what is going on. A lot of it is a learned behavior. And so when we address with the parents, the parents don't understand that it's an issue because they're dealing with them themselves. Um, 
a lot of the um, policies that we have in place, people don't realize, as Casey said, they come from the state. Our hands are tied in a lot of the areas. We can only do what they allow us to do. There is some leeway, but again, our policies come from the state. Um, as far as metal detectors and things like that in our schools, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I don't think we've had a big issue regarding weapons being brought into school or things along those lines. Um, but again, if we can deal with situations that are going on at home, then we wouldn't have these issues going on at school. Okay, thank you. Dennis Myers. The question can't be answered. I don't think we need a metal detectors. We need to follow the discipline code. We need the consequences. Um, it seems to me that it starts from the top that we have, we have the rules there. We have the code put in place and we do not follow it. I, I don't know how you get the teachers, the principals, the whoever, the staff to follow the rules. If we give up and say, well, the parents or the state says we can't do this, then we might as well just quit. You can't solve a problem unless you meet it head on and try to do something different. We've had in-school suspension. We've had stay after school. We've had some Saturday detention. But I think, I feel that we have no longer hold those standards or those codes that are in the discipline. I've had a teacher say, well, she had a student, two students are fighting outside her room. So she goes out and she's trying to stop them from being fighting. She calls the counselor. The counselor comes up, gets kicked by the student. And she says, what are you gonna do? He says, for what? For what? If we don't have the consequences, we don't have discipline. All right, Casey Seal. Mr. Winker, will you please read it one more time? Sure, no problem. Uh, given the incidence of school violence uh, throughout the country, what's your strategy or policy for keeping students safe at school? And discuss a little bit your beliefs on student discipline. Okay, well, like I stated before, um, there's a great deal of law mandates that teachers have to follow. And I think they do an excellent job of following them. Um, there are policies in place that I think, as Audrey mentioned, we do have a little bit of leeway. Uh, I spent some time reading through the actual Senate bill, SB 100, trying to understand the legal jargon. <laughs> and if I'm reading it correctly, there is some leeway in there with, with school boards and a parent teacher advisory committee where you can kind of set up the guidelines to follow. And maybe we need to look at tweaking those. Maybe there shouldn't be so many steps in between A and B or so many boxes to tick before you can move on to the next thing. But if you want my personal opinion about discipline, to be completely honest with you, I think the most effective discipline is the discipline that inconveniences the parent. Because as Audrey said, a lot of these issues are coming from the home. A parent that doesn't respond to a phone call, a parent that doesn't come to school for a meeting, is a parent that's clearly not present in their children's lives. So if you have a, a consequence that inconveniences the parent and they have to respond, there may be a little bit more parent support for that to not happen again. Okay, thank you. Jack Sosnowski. This is a very passionate uh, discussion of, uh, of the board right now because for the last year I've been asking the school to uh, create a strategy around security. The school violence is a big deal and it's an area that we do have an officer, a, a not a police officer, but somebody who actually is anointed to go through and determine if there is a violent situation, we have a protocol that we follow step by step by step to protect the individuals involved and the biases that may be part of the discussion um, that uh, are presented to the Board of Education. That task team um, also includes training for our staff, right? 
how, how to de-escalate situations, how to get involved, but de-escalate things. You know, we have a major proposal that was part of the board meeting last, uh, last board meeting to overhaul how we do this in the protocol that we have. You know that we've been dealing with the Secret Service, the FBI and other subject matter experts to bring the best and brightest approach to our school district. No, because we don't talk about those things, we do these things, right? The other thing too is if you talk about the discipline and the escalation process, you have to respect the individuals, you have to hear what they have to say, and you have to be unbiased in our approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chapman. I don't think anybody here at this table had any things I didn't agree with as, as far as making the school safer. I feel any idea that makes the school safer is a great idea. Um, I think my mindset goes back to this. Students need to be held accountable for their actions. Parents need to be held accountable for their students. Our educators in this district have some great ideas on how to expand this. They need to be heard. Administration needs to implement the best ideas efficiently. Some of the things I bring to the table is seeing the average family unit in town or a family unit in town and culture. The lack of parents engaged concerns me. And uh, I think that's a vision that I could also bring on how to improve. Okay, thank you, Martha First. I'm, I'm gonna reverse the order if that's okay. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit on the discipline front. There have been a lot of good points made. Um, I think it's important to point out that we are being closely monitored by the state for disproportionate discipline towards black young men in our school district. This is something we have to be very methodical about because we want to make sure that any discipline is equitable and we're not targeting any one group. Um, a lot of good things have been said about families and family engagement. Uh, but I do think we're making efforts on the social emotional learning front to build self esteem and to build behaviors that hopefully will bear fruit in terms of behavior. Uh, but discipline is not something you can be reactive about. We have a discipline policy. We're very methodical. There are certain interventions that have to take place before certain uh, extreme consequences can take place. Um, but obviously we want to make sure our school system is safe for all staff and all students. And then quickly on security, which is on everybody's mind, be it what it's like to be in a bathroom at a school to uh, the, the gun threats in our culture today that sometimes have had horrible shootings. But I think Jack spoke to these well in terms of the uh, security the security presentation we recently had at the school board meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Moore Howard, you get the first shot at this question. Uh, what's your position on the whole topic that's so, that's just all over the country about banning books, teaching books, what should be taught, certain language, certain topics, controversial issues. How should, how should all of that be treated uh, in the classroom and by a school board? Um, as far as banning books and things along those lines, um, I remember when my children were small, in the morning we would read a book, and at night we would read a book. That's what's wrong with us now. We're not reading those books. I mean, they have the tablets and they want to read on the tablets, but there's nothing so good as to have a book in your hand and read that to a child, whether it's yours or someone else's. Um, we're, 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 we seem to be concentrating on so many things that we've gotten away from, and that's why we have the children that we have and the conditions that we have. Um, I, I still go back to it takes a community. Uh, yeah, it, we just need to go back to the basics. We can't expect our children to be different. Or, or let me rephrase that. We can't expect our children to be like others. We need to go back to being the way that we were. You know, as I said before, the books, the reading, the math, the cursive. We need to get back to doing things that make sense. How are you going to sign a check if you don't know how to write in cursive? We're taking too many things out of our districts. 
that are important for everyday living. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Myers. Yes. I'm not here to ban books. I'm not here to say what's important. Well, I am what's important. I think we have to focus on the core curriculum. If there are books out there that are in the schools that do are not part of the curriculum, are not part of the educating of the students, that's fine. Well, I, that's what we need to focus on. If there's these books would interfere with what the parents want, with what the morals or the values of the parent, and if they offend any uh, parents, then I would say that we would have to look into that then. Just to say we're gonna allow all books or fan the flames that, well, books are okay. If, if they're age appropriate, that's fine. If they're gender appropriate, that's fine. But to push some of these things on younger students, I don't believe in that. Thank you. Okay, Casey, see it. Okay, I'm gonna ask you again. There were a lot of parts to nope, that. Can no you... problem. So what is your position on uh, the teaching of different types of books, banning books that contain certain language? This is a topic all over the country. Uh, the discussion of controversial topics in the classroom. How do you how do you think a school board should handle those types of issues? Well, I think a lot of those topics, hot topics across the country, um, are somewhat politicized and really shouldn't have anything to do with education. I don't think that we should have people saying what parts of history we can and can't teach. Our history is our history. We need to learn all of it, where we've been, so we don't go back there. We can't pick and choose the parts that make us comfortable and only talk about those. Um, you can't. Same with banning books. I don't, I don't see how that's even a conversation. I don't, there are age appropriate books. books. There are books that have topics that I don't even read. I don't think those are being introduced at school. I think the schools are doing the really good job of keeping appropriate books in there, but there's no reason we have to ban them. Children can read books when they get to the appropriate age. They can pick and choose the books that apply to something that they're going through or that they identify with. It's, I don't, it, it doesn't need to come to the schools to ban the books. Um, basically, yeah, the cultural things that are going on Okay, thank you, Mr. Sosnowski. So there is an awful lot of, uh, I'll call it, uh, rattling of the swords, right? But I would encourage each and every one of us to do your own research, because there's a lot of fiction out there. There are a lot of things that are, are touted, and there are a lot of political things that are going on, but they simply aren't true. We simply don't get those. And I will tell you, that it's not about the books, it's about the ebooks, right? It's about the technology. They can get it all on the web today, right? So, you know, for us, it's making sure that we have elements like our MTSS in place, right? We now have K through five lined up. So all the curriculum is the same. We have AVID now across the entire district. Those are structured, disciplined courses that we're educating our kids with. So, I ask you, do your research. Don't jump to a conclusion. Don't run up that ladder of inference and say, oh my God, I went from point A to B to D without knowing your facts. As an educator, as, as a, a community of continuous education, learn your own facts. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chapman. This one's kind of easy for me. Um, listen to the teachers. I'm not an educator and I will not pretend to be one. Um, I believe we have several outstanding teachers in the district. I have witnessed this firsthand. I believe teachers who excel in performance and loyal to loyalty to stay with our district should be properly compensated. I believe in generous performance and length of service incentives. There is a national teacher shortage. I believe to progress, we must have the absolute best. 
And to piggyback on what Jack was talking about with finding employees, I get to deal with this every day in my three businesses, and he's exactly right. We need to retain the excellent talent that we have that are engaged with our children. All right, thank you. Uh, Martha first. Mr. Winker, could you read the question again? Yes, I can. Uh, what's your position on the whole topic of uh, banning books and what should be taught and how should controversial topics and languages, a uh, language be addressed uh, in the classroom and how should a board of education deal with that? Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, I have a loud voice anyway. Um, I was tutoring today at Blackhawk School, which I occasionally do, which really is having kids read to me. And I started by saying, do you like to read? Do you like this book? And they do, they like to read, they like trying new books. And the one thing we wanna do is encourage exploration in libraries for age appropriate people of all ages. It lifetime learning. And we, uh, you know, it's been said that when you start banning books, um, that's the first thing to happen in certain cultures that then move towards fascism, which is a little off subject, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, I, I love what Casey said in terms of let's be real about our history and let's not hide it. Let's be grown up about it. Um, and history, we our historians are constantly learning new things and we, we wanna stay up on that history that's been done. Uh, I have a cousin or his wife is a librarian at Harlem District, which by the way, when we were talking about property tax rates and different school districts, there are very different differences between different school districts. Um, but they went through a book banning exercise at Harlem. And one of the books that they wanted to ban was the Toni Morrison book, The Bluest Eye. Um, it was a very difficult process for my cousin's wife, the librarian, and I don't want to see Freeport go down that road. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Huber. Yes, in regards to banning books, first and foremost, the Freeport School District is a, uh, it's a public school district. So why would we ever ban a book? We should be encouraging our youth to read age appropriate books. So, uh, no, no to the banning books. Uh, we want to encourage reading because we got to get those test scores up. So uh, working on that's uh, a big deal. Uh, kids reading is, is great for a multitude of reasons. Uh, one, so they can broaden their interests and figure out what they want to do in their adult life. What, what are their interests? What do they want to pursue in life? Uh, broaden their educational base. So that way, over time, all this reading will make them uh, more productive citizens, more respectable citizens, uh, more employable citizens. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think that ends our questioning. So now we'll begin a, a one minute closing statement. And we'll start with uh, Dennis Myers. Good, I'm gonna finish my bio. Uh, I now reside at 1448 West Demeter Drive with my second wife, Patty Ludwig Myers. She taught at First Ward, Taylor Park and Empire for 34 years. She was the first director of the Children's Dyslexia Center, Northwest Illinois for 17 years, as well as an adjunct professor. I received my certification in Orton Gillingham approach to children with dyslexia and tutored for four years. The program works. I taught students, you could see them growing, feeling so proud and just exploding when they were learning to read. I would appreciate your vote so I can focus on the curriculum that will enable our students to succeed in reading and math. I'll be a strong voice for the parents. I believe with effective leadership, our district will move forward in a positive direction. Okay, thank you, Casey Seal. So a good school board is a well-rounded school board. A school board that's made up of people from different backgrounds and life experiences, people with different skills and strengths to bring to the table. 
I'm a dedicated community member and I'm dedicated to this community's children. I'm actively involved in school culture and at events. I think I bring a unique perspective to the table um, as a parent, as a community member, as a local business owner. I have a vested interest in seeing these schools succeed. Um, a local hair, I'm a hair local hairdresser of the last decade, and I spend every single day talking to community members from different backgrounds, different ages, and I have a very good understanding of what our community wants, of what our teachers need, and what our children deserve. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from Ed Markey. Although children make up only 24% of our population, they are 100% of our future, and we cannot afford to provide any child with a substandard education. Okay, thank you. Jack Sosnowski. Excellent, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to host this event. You know, we have to focus on our core values and core beliefs, and that's around academic achievement, continuous learning, parent and community involvement are key, student-focused outcomes, equity for all, cultural awareness and tolerance. You gotta remember this, we are a public body for the public good. We have to do everything possible to support the state and federal mandates that are given to us, even if we don't get any money. We are a nonpartisan body, nonpartisan. We focus on what's important for our kids. Our teachers and our staff are dedicated subject matter experts that work tirelessly, who love, motivate, encourage all of the social emotional learning that we have. In short, we've just generated $21.5 million of Besser funds to do that. We spent over $13 million rebuilding this school district that's been neglected forever. And I've reduced the taxpayer, the local taxpayer rate by 10% in the last year or so. Please let us continue the good work that we've done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Timothy Chapman. As a community, we are all in this together. I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight by being involved with the potential outcome of not only the school district, but the community. If I did nothing more tonight than to convince people to demand a better school product for their tax dollar, I will consider that a major win. I'll be on the ballot April 4th and would appreciate your vote. I would love to have open communication with anyone that has positive ideas on how to make Freeport a great place to live, work, or play. Thank you and have a good night. Hey, thank you, Martha first. Well, I have some something written down. And I'm going to uh, deviate a little bit from it. I want to thank my fellow people who are running for the board. This is really remarkable in a democracy that we have this many people, and originally it was 11, show up and want to be part of the school board. We've got three people who are incumbents who have served and know how hard it is, and it's a privilege to serve with them. Um, but for our schools to progress, it can't all be on the backs of the teachers and the staff. It's going to take a community. It's going to take family engagement. And again, I'm very thankful for all the people who have been interested and passionate. Now, certainly, I'd like you to vote for me on April 4th. <laughs> um, but uh, I appreciate the league and the other uh, groups putting this together. I appreciate the civil discourse um, and uh, I'm proud to be a pretzel. Hey, thank you, Mr. Lynn Huber. Yes, for the folks that put this on, thank you very much. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity to, to voice how each and every one of us want to help uh, the young people in the community and to ultimately make the community a better place. And that is first and foremost why I'm running. That's why I want to earn your vote. Um, I want to do everything in my God-given power to um, do my part to change the standard and raise the bar. Um, good night and God bless. Hey, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Audrey Moore Howard. I'd like to say thank you for the organizations who have um, given us, us the opportunity to be able to uh, bring our, uh, what do I wanna say, bring our strengths um, to you. I wanna say thank you for you coming out. Thank you for those who are, are viewing online. Um, as I said before, it's not just um, a race. 
It's about a passion to be able to assist the district, to assist our children. Um, I am committed not only to um, the school district, I'm committed to the board with us as a strong unit, I believe that we can continue to make the district better and improve areas that are lacking. And then those areas that we need to bring and implement, I, I want to be able to do that with the board members. And so I am soliciting your vote on April 4th uh, to continue to do what I do. Okay, well, let's have a round of applause for all of our... Ms. Uh, Ms. Cook has a few final comments to make. Thank you all. Uh, I appreciate what you all said. Uh, as you thanked the audience for coming, for caring to be an informed voter, we really appreciate that. And again, to all the candidates, the time and effort that you're putting into this uh, to, be, to participate in democracy and make things better in our community. Just reminding everybody about April 4th, early voting is going on right now at the Stewart Center. And uh, you can also vote by mail, but then if you don't do either of those things, then on April 4th, be sure you know where your precinct polling place is and uh, show up that day. Offer a neighbor a ride if someone you know uh, doesn't have a way to get there. This, is, this matters to all of us. And again, thank you so much. And to Highland for hosting us and Mike Gunderson for our technology. Thank you.